All right, we're live. Welcome to another episode of Monday Night Live on Ten Horse Money YouTube channel. We got a great guest tonight. We got Bassmaster Classic champ, Forcewood Cup champ, Lake of the Ozarks Hammer, Dion Hibden. He's going to be on in just a second. But before we bring him in, just wanted to say, give a shout out to um, some of the people that have been working with me um, the last year or so that's really helped this channel grow. Uh, shout out to Cumberland Pro Lures. Um, American made stuff out of Georgia. If you haven't checked out Cumberland Pro stuff, check them out. You can, they're on Omnia Fishing, they're on Tackle Warehouse. Um, several retailers out there, great products. Um, you've seen them in a lot of my videos. Great, great fish catchers. Also, Hogs Custom Baits. Hogs is a uh, they they hand pour a lot. Well, not hand pour, but small operation, mom and pop type deal. Pouring good quality soft plastics. They got a website up and running, so you can look them up on the World Wide Web. Great products, great guys, um, really good dudes. And shout out to um, Winning Edge Fishing. Um, Rob They've been is, doing a great job. Yeah, Rob is the guy that does um, all the media stuff for me. If you see those Facebook posts and the Instagram posts, that's Rob. And so if you're if you're in a business and you're looking for somebody to spread the good word about your company, um, Winning Edge Fishing can certainly help you out. And shout out to Mike Russell down there in Kentucky, Bag Five Baits. He's painting up quality custom stuff. If you need something painted or you're looking for a little bit interesting color, just he's super, super detailed, does a great job. Um, Bag Five Baits. And that is it. So let's get Dion in here. Let's I'm do excited it. to get this, this show Please. started. Story time, Monday yeah. night story time. Let's Love pull it. Dion in here. He's back there looking in the background. So, what's going on, buddy? How are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We are doing good. I'm it's doing been a, good. It's been a long day. I, uh, I've i been working on live scope all weekend, getting it installed on my boat. And I, uh, you're going to see me like wince a couple times tonight because I rolled over. I was on my belly in a compartment trying to get live scope installed. And I rolled over on my needle nose or something that was laying in my boat. And I got a bruised rib or something all day. And then yesterday, <laughs> I was walking between my downstairs garage and the shop to get parts for my, uh, I put a new, I put a new fuse panel in just for the live scope or all my graphs. And well, if you're not from Southeast Missouri, you don't know this, but we got a little ice storm last week. Just a little one. Just a little one. We got about four inches of sleet at my house and it's got enough glaze on it. And I walked about 10 steps out there yesterday and hit a slick spot and slid about 15 foot down my hill. And I stopped. And at the bottom of my hill is a pond. <laughs> so i got a piece of grass i think it was one little onion sticking up through the yard and i grabbed onto it and i'm hanging on it's your lifeline uh-huh and i got back up got my feet underneath me and i made like three steps and i did it again oh so my i got a, i got a bum hip and a, a bruised rib from working on live scope so i hope it's worth it did you get it done it is it is powered it is ready to go i just have to for one clean up the boat the boat is a disaster right now um, but I need to put my trail motor pan back in my recessed foot pedal back in. Um, and then I got to build my mount. Okay. So other than that, it is, it is live. Live scope is live. Okay. So check I'm excited. Into your, check into your new, uh, right, right now there's a brand new update that really makes a, makes a huge difference on them. Okay. Um, I mean, Lawson just got his updated in the last two or three days. Uh, but it's like, say it's a brand new update. You know that you can put on them and and uh, it sure cleared up his picture so, perfect yeah i'm gonna do that install you know i had the last couple of days off and that was on my <laughs> list of things to do and i kept forgetting to do it and um so i need to do that this week get it installed and i've, I've been watching i've watched like several videos on it it seems like it makes a really really big difference kind of helps get rid of that that tree you know that live scope tree yeah what so. one thing you need to make sure you know when whenever you're installing that stuff is um you know to get those great pictures um all of the cords the transducer cords and everything are made so much better than they have been in the past and so therefore they're also more fragile so they're telling us not to use wire ties even if you tape it to your tr shaft make sure you don't pull down on the tape real hard uh they don't like the, you know, like all your access that you have that's left. They don't like you to wind it up 
you know, normally, you know, I used to just wind it up, you know, make a little loop of it and uh, put a wire tie on it, throw it in the front, you know, the front end of the boat. Uh, but they're saying, don't wind it up, just leave it loose, just throw it in the front, you know, up there under your front console and, and uh, just leave it loose. Don't bind it up in any way. Uh, and we've done that on, on Lawson's boat. And uh, it does. His picture is much better than mine. Mine, really? was rigged. mine was rigged when I got it. His was rigged, but we had to put a new transducer on it because he tore, tore it off. And uh, so we had to put a new transducer on it. And we did that on his, and his picture is much cleaner than mine. So I'll keep I'll keep that in mind when I because yeah. I haven't I haven't tidied up all my wires and I'm like you though of the old days where man I like everything nice and neat and tidied sure, up up there absolutely. but I remember the last time we had you on you were mentioning that it was just you had a buddy that was laying on the front deck just kind of out in the open yeah and you kind of were like what the heck's going on with this and he said the picture is a lot better so I remembered that and I'm gonna I'm gonna just basically spread it all out underneath my trolling motor pan as long yeah, as. Like you know, like you used to, you know, when you had to go up under your, your front panel on your boat, a lot of times, you know, you just leave it loose and run it over there and put your screws back down. And well, it'd have a little bend in it. That really works on your picture. I mean, right. you got to make sure that everything just doesn't get bound up, no crimping. I mean, you know, make sure that it's just real loose, you know, up there. And, uh, you know, anytime your trolling motor is going up and down and everything, you just, those cables are just real you just got to be gentle with them. That's all I'm saying, you know, to get the premium picture out of it. How do you guys have it attached to your trolling motor shaft? Or what is your recommendation on that? My, we're still going with it attached to our shaft. Uh, we're not doing any of the extra, you know, the extra add-ons for that just yet. Um, you know, we're, see, the thing of it is, it's not new for, it's not new for me. Okay. I, I was with Garmin when it first came out. So I've had it the same way for a lot of years. Uh, so it's a little bit trickier for me and Lawson to get used to doing that other stuff. Uh, right. We still like it on the trolling motor as of right now. Uh, I'm not saying that when we get our new boats, we're not going to try something uh, because I've heard a lot of good, you know, good deals from buddies of mine. You know, I've actually fished out of a couple of boats that had, you know, those little add ons where, uh, you know, it had its own little shaft and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I say, the boats we're in right now, we're still, we still got them attached to the bottom part of the trolling motor. And that's kind of what we're used to. Have you guys taped the wire onto your shaft then? We do. We have taped it on there, but like I say, we just, we just go around it several times, but we just don't ever, you know, pull it down and break the tape or nothing like that. It's just, I got you. you know, it's just, I can move it. I can slip it in under the tape any, anytime, anywhere I want to, Okay. you know? I was actually thinking about buying one of those, uh, the TH Marine, the sleeves. Yep. I was thinking about what, using one of those and just wrapping my wires up my shaft with that just to keep it from binding up. Least amount of cramp, cramps, the least amount of pressure, you're just going to have a better picture. Gotcha. Yeah, well, and that, I'll definitely and keep that in mind. That, that's a deal where we've, I mean, we've, everybody we know has got it now and working with it and stuff like that and. And uh, the best ones are the ones that are, you know, rigged right, you know. Right. So, have you tried the perspective mount? You know, where it shoots kind of sideways instead of straight ahead. No, we we haven't yet. But uh, I did a I did a couple of days worth of seminars last week, and uh, and and it's with with some guys that talked about it, and uh, these are guys that actually work work at Garmin. Uh, you know, I was at the Kansas City Boat Show, and, uh, and you know, and I, I heard some really, really cool things about it, uh, you know, especially in shallow water. You mm -hmm. know, from 10 foot, the 10 foot or less deal, that's going to be a must. You know, that's going to be what you have to have, uh, you know, or, or it sounds like it as of right now. Uh, you know, lots of guys already using it, lots of guys already very efficient at it. Uh, we just, we haven't. We haven't yet, but yeah, it's coming. It's going to be the next thing. I've been amazed. I, I got it on my boat and I've had it out twice. I was out yesterday for the second time using it. And I'm amazed at how, well, two things that really stand out other than the actual seeing the fish, but how it affects the, 
the bottom of the lake, like the structure that you can see, um, as far as like a channel ledge, like say your boat's, you know, sitting in 30 foot of water and there's a creek channel or something that comes straight up. You can swing that the head of that trolling motor around and you can see exactly where that thing comes up and you can, you know, right where you're, you know, if you're just going to fish the drop, you know, exactly where to cast at just to fish that drop. And then the other thing was sometimes on side scan, um, like a little stump or something will kind of kind of blend in with the background. But yeah. with that that live scope, you can spin it around there and it, it's it sticks up just like it's supposed to. And you can see it. Um, there's a couple I was fishing uh, back in this little creek yesterday and um, I was seeing I was seeing some stuff on the like little stumps and stuff that I didn't know were there. You know, and I've scanned that area several times. But I'm I'm just can't wait to get out there and start playing around with it and see all the things that I've been missing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's it's going to be the next thing. I mean, it's crazy. It's, um, it's it's just amazing to me how this stuff has just all of a sudden just blown out of proportion. I mean, it's just, it's going every which direction, you know. If you don't have it, you're not going to compete, you know. Uh, right. And at, at first I thought, nah, that's not the way it is. But there's going to be certain times of the year where you won't be able to keep up with some of these other guys. Uh, you know, there's there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, I've I mean, I've already seen seen it, you know, the way it is. Uh, you know, Lawson right now and uh, a couple of guys from the Warsaw area uh, that are very efficient at it. I mean, you just don't beat them right now. I mean, right now when it's really, really cold, you cannot beat them. They're first mm -hmm. and second in every damn tournament. Hmm. on Lake of the Ozarks anyways. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, and I know I've fished some of them <laughs> and, <laughs> and thought I could catch them pretty well, but, uh, but no, they, it just, you just key in on them one or two big fish a day, you know, and you know, where most of us are just fishing and, and, uh, you know, fishing for them and stuff like that. They don't fish for them until they find them. You know, they don't, they don't waste any time. They wait till they find the right one, you know, and once you get 15 pounds on the boat, you know, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm fishing for biggins the rest of the day. Uh, really, are you, you know, that's the thing, you know, you can think you are, but they are, you know, they, they are hunting till they find the right fish that they know is a big bass. And then they sit and they make him bite, you know, they, they mess with him with, an array of different lures until they catch him. And, and I mean, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot like bed fishing, you know, now, you know, when you're, you know, when they're spawning in the spring, you know, I'm going to catch a limit of them bucks in about 10 minutes. And then I'm not going to slow down until I find the ones I want to catch, you know, you know, I'm going to pass them three pounders and even four pounders until I find a five. And then I'm going to spend a few minutes and make it bite. You know, and uh, that's that's what this is like right now. Uh, you know, they they just you know they don't waste no, waste any time fishing for the wrong fish. You know, uh, they go till they find a big one, then they catch it. And yeah, they, talk about sight fishing here. Yeah, I, and I that's what of, it is. I got <laughs> a lot of work to do. <laughs> you got a lot of work to do, but <laughs> I was just thinking, uh, talking to uh, some of that we had on the stream a couple weeks ago. Who Dion and your your father taught to sight fish. He's from Japan. Oh yeah, June Shoji. June Mac. June Mac. That's right. Yeah, June Mac. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Super super good guy. He sent us some swim baits over. Why don't you grab those swim baits, man? He he's making he's making some pretty nice glide baits nowadays. Uh, Dream Express lures. He sent those over to us. And uh, yeah, yeah, All they're right. pretty nice. I'll have to call that sorry jackass. <laughs> I bet I'm betting if I'm a betting man, he's on here tonight. He's on. No, here. I'm I'm sure he is too. He's a cool Holy dude. God. I mean, we had you know, when we went to Japan, we went to Japan for like I think it was like 20 days. And and you know, I I I I loved it. Me and dad both. We we loved it. We enjoyed it. A lot of the fishermen didn't like those long periods of time. Well, if you're going to take time to fly over there, I mean, you might as well spend a little time. And we really enjoyed it. And the reason we really enjoyed it 
is because of a little handful of guys that were like our interpreters and stuff like that. And June was, June was one of those. June was one of the guys that hung out with us the whole time we were over there. And uh, the other one, I'll tell you how long ago this was that we were there. The other one was Takahiro. Oh, Wow. Takahiro, Takahiro was one of our interpreters, which at that time he couldn't speak any more English than we could. But once he got the offer to come out and help out with us, he, yeah, he, he lied to everybody and said he could speak a little English because he came to us. He wanted to know and he wanted to fish with us and he wanted to be on the water. And, uh, and the neat thing about it was we came back to the United States and uh, within just a couple of years, I drawed Takahiro three different times in the invitationals. And uh, one of them was in the tournament that he won here on Lake of the Ozarks. Wow. I drawed him on the final day. And wow. he was leading the tournament. <laughs> he would, I don't think he could have won without me that day because his spot had got beat up pretty hard. He was fishing right there by PB2, and and uh, his stuff had got beat up pretty bad by the last day. And, and we went up the lake, and... He caught about 18 pounds off of what I knew to catch him off of, and and uh, it's pretty cool. It was it was a lot of fun to be in on his first win, that's for sure. So, what was Japan like? I mean, okay, how long were you over there, and um, what what you guys? I, I'm it's all that that's a mystery to me over there. Obviously, I've we never were, been. We were we were over there for Team Daiwa uh, way back when when we were both on the Team Daiwa team. Uh, me and Dad were over there. We spent like 20 days. We fished four different tournaments in the 20 days. Uh, you know, a couple of their big tournaments um, and then a couple of small tournaments that we just fished just kind of for fun in between things. Uh, we worked some shows while we were over there. They get their money's worth out of you. Trust me, if you're American, you go over there. Yeah, they're going to work you to death. Uh yeah. When we got back on the plane, I don't think me and dad spoke for whatever it was, the 13-hour trip back. I don't think we were awake 10 minutes of the trip home. Uh, they they just they want everything they can get out of you. And and we had a great time. We had a great time. I mean, and, and what made it nice was, like I say, hanging out with some of them young guys that, you know, wanted to learn and wanted to be a part of what, you know, just be a part of any of it. Uh, and you know, that made it nice, you know, uh, about 10 days in though, you're pretty much looking for a cheeseburger somewhere, uh, <laughs> you know, because I, I actually made the comment we were driving down the road and we'd come back to the, to the city. Um, uh, and we were somewhere there around Tokyo. And, uh, I made the comment as we were in the back seat about, I would give my left testicle for a piece of fried chicken. <laughs> you know but you know how i said it you know sure. uh but anyways <laughs> the very next night now we had that that time the president of Daiwa, i mean the king guru he was in the truck with us he traveled around with us because he thought dad was the coolest guy he'd ever seen you know and and just the way D dad treated the other fishermen and talked to the other fishermen and everything uh you know, now he knew I was all business. You know, I was I was there to fish and try to take their money. You know, I didn't want them getting getting anything I want a part of. I wanted to win everything I was over there. Um, but anyways, and uh, yeah, very next night we make a corner. He told us we was going someplace special, and uh, we rounded the corner and I seen a KFC down the down the road. <laughs> and he holds his hand back behind him and he goes, "Testicle, please." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. But uh, but no, it, it was fun. It, it's just like you'd imagine, though. I mean, you talk to nobody. It, I mean, I can't feature going over there by myself at all. You know, I had dad, and, you know, we conversed back and forth. But even the easiest of stuff, you know, to walk in a convenience store and buy a soda, I mean, you can't do it without their help. I mean, because the money's different. The money exchange is confusing. You know, uh, you can't tell the prices on anything. You know, they said I did great in the fishing, you know, I couldn't prove it by me. I don't know how much money I made, you know. Um, but anyways, you know, I, I finished second in a couple of the tournaments and and, and finished fourth in another one. Um, but, you know, like I say, it, it was you were 
for those guys to come over here and spend a whole season, my hat's off to them. That's that's amazing, you know, that they can do that. Because I've been on the other side of it. I've went over there and I've dealt with them. The neat thing about those people over there, they treat you like kings. I mean, you're you're like a step above everybody else. I mean, I was over there and I if I wouldn't have wanted to have retied my own fishing tackle, I wouldn't have had to. I mean, never touched my bags, not one time. Uh, I mean, my suitcase was carried for me more than ever in my lifetime, you know. Uh, they just, they don't let you do anything. They take care of you. Uh, you know, boats, gas, stuff, stuff like that. You never had to touch a thing. All you had to do is get in and go fishing. Um, and And it's just... It's a shame that we didn't treat them that way when they came over here. But, uh, you know, every and, and it's just that you're the odd duck out. You know, now there was tons of people that stood back and looked at us, you know, the whole time and, and wouldn't come up and speak. But I actually kind of got into it with the, the super duper fisherman over there uh, in one of the tournaments. Um, I had started a little lake called Katara. It's a little flatwater lake. And it had these... Uh, like gates that went out into the fields that they let the water in and out of the in and out of the lake to go out and and uh, put in the fields, you know, irrigate the fields. Well, every one of those had a little gravelly spot right out in front of it that you could drag Carolina rig over and and catch them. Well, I figured this out pretty quick. Me and Dad did, and uh, I ran up the lake, you know, a little bit further than most, and uh, stopped on one. And uh, as soon as I stopped, you know, there's always tons and tons of boats around you. You know, some of them watching, some of them are in the tournament watching, some of them are fishing. And uh, well, needless to say, me with Carolina rig, I can take out a pretty good swath of people if I need to, you know. So, so I had my little dam that I was sitting in front of pretty well covered, you know, and I was sitting close enough to it that nobody was going to get a cast in there. And, and a guy stopped and he was in a big old champion boat. I mean, you know, really nice boat, which there's not many big boats at that time. There wasn't many big boats, uh, you know, out there with like 200s, 225s. Most of them's little boats, you know, lots of little boats with 40 horse on them, stuff like that. And, uh, but this boat pulls in and when he goes to come through all these other boats that are already there, I mean, it's like the parting of the Red Sea. They're just getting out of the way. It's like, <laughs> get out of this guy's way, you know, and uh, I turned around, and I asked Dr. Hero, I said, who's this chump, you know, and he's like, oh, and I, and I said, yeah, I said, who is he, and I pointed at him, and Dr. Hero wouldn't look at him, that's how intimidated he was, but he wouldn't even look at him, and uh, he said, oh, and he couldn't come up with the word to tell me who he was, or, or what he was, and finally, he came out with, he's the monster, I said, huh? I said, he's a little bit short fellow. How's he the monster? You know, you know, I would expect the monster to be sumo or something. And I was just joking with him, you know. But he came right on in there, and he came right on in. Everybody got out of the way. He's fixing to haul off and cast up on my spot. I just cut him off. You know, I, I take my Carolina rig. I sling it about an extra 40 yards than I needed to, and I just cut him off. You know, I throw it about that far in front of his trolling motor. And so he goes and takes off. And gets on his trail motor, goes all the way around me. I mean, he has to go a hundred yards out of the way, gets up on the left left side of me, and he's fixing to throw again. I just hoist her off that side and I cut him off again. There's only about a spot, maybe 10 foot wide, where the fish are at. Well, I'd been there long enough, I'd already had that figured out, you know. So I made a big old long cast in front of him there. Needless to say, to make a long story short, I caught about 16 pounds. I kept everybody out of it till I was totally done with it. You know, I thought, well, if they catch any out of there now, they're going to work on bruised ones right now. And uh, and I did. I kept him kind of hosed out of it until I was done with it. When I was done with it, hell, I just jerked troll motor up and left. <laughs> Needless to say, when we got to the weigh-in, here comes this guy. Comes walking right up to us. And uh, he walks right up to, to Takahiro and me and Dad and June Mack and and Masaki Shimano was one of the guys that we were there with, and uh, he was kind of catering around to us. And uh, this guy walks right up to us, 
every other bass fisherman there besides me, Dad, and Masaki Shimano, they're all standing there looking at their shoes, and, you know, out of respect for this dude. And me and Dad, we're just like, ah, I don't get it, <laughs> you know. But we stood there, and he walks up to us, and he got one of the interpreters, not Takahiro or not June, one that could actually speak to us. And uh, he told me that that was very good tournament play that I had showed him this morning. You know, <laughs> he was used to, he was not used to that happening, but that's, he said he could see why I beat him in the tournament, you know, because I kept him off of a good spot. And uh, I said, I was just trying to do my job out there, you know, and, and he turned around and walked away and everybody standing there went to poking me like I was, you know, the, 900 pound grizzly bear in the bunch you know and and uh and then they got it across to me june and talk hero that he was the top guy in japan i mean he was the best fisherman in the in the land over there and and uh yeah i'd kept him off his first fishing spot and he had never had that happen to him and i and i just told him i'm like i didn't know the guy from adam's house cat i said Hell, I, I didn't know who he was but i said i know he wasn't gonna fish my little pile of rocks not while I was sitting there. And well, uh, and that's the difference in, in their culture and our culture. Oh, absolutely. You, you know, KVD pulls up on a spot. You ain't giving it up. I was no, here first. And those, but those people over there, they thought he was another step above them and get out of the way, let him have it. When he's done, we'll scarf up the scraps. Well, right. I didn't, hell, I didn't know the difference. <laughs> I, yeah. I didn't give him nothing, you know, but. He ran into a hardhead boy from Missouri that was yeah, on his yeah. ground. He didn't understand anything and didn't care, really. You know, needed another piece of fried chicken at that point in the week. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's it's a different place. It's very cool, though. They take care of the resource very much, uh, way way better than we do. Uh, their their lakes are all well taken care of. Uh, well, until they decided that bass was an evasive species and now they've got that to deal with that's um, what june was telling me i, did, I didn't yeah. know that they have uh on-site waste disposal areas where if you yeah. catch a, a largemouth bass you're supposed to just throw it in the trash yep yep um, <clears throat> yeah that and you know it, it was it was a cool trip we had a great time you know it, it's a different place that's for sure it's a different place but those guys love to fish they just want to learn uh they work very hard at it. Their tackle is immaculate. I mean, uh, a guy might not have, and, and when I, what I saw over there was, is that fishermen might not, might not have 10 rods. They might have a half a dozen rods that they have and that they use. Now things have probably changed because that was, you know, 20 plus years ago, but they had six to eight or nine rods that were they were clean they washed them i mean they would get in from fishing and they would stand there and wipe them down and stuff you know oh. and uh and me and dad you know we just it was just amazing how immaculate their stuff was they would clean their line you know they would they would you know take strip the line off their rods and then run it through a rag a cloth and and clean clean their line to put it back on the rod because they Things and at that point in time, things were very expensive over there too. You know, a lot of it. Uh, so they just took very, very good care of all their stuff. You know, where you and I just cut off a bait and throw it down on the floor of the boat, and we'll get to it later. Which ninety percent of the time you never do. You know, right. it's it's rusty there when you sell your boat. You know, yeah. uh, but those people would take off lures, lay them out, dry them off, and lay them out, and then put them back in their tackle box as soon as it was dried off. You know. Um, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was a cool culture to see, you know, uh, you know, but it was, it was, it was, it was a journey. I, I truly enjoyed it. Probably one of the, probably one of the funnest trips I've ever been on that I was out of the country, you know, uh, you know, it, and, and the way you were treated was just, just crazy. I mean, I've never been, I've never been treated like that anywhere in the world ever, uh, you know, well, what was the best my... food you had over there besides the fried chicken? Oh, I'm a big sushi eater. Yeah. Trust me, buddy. I, I can eat the hell out of that sushi. That don't buy <laughs> I love sushi. And trust me, there was places there where they wouldn't eat it because it was too far from the coast. If you ate sushi in Japan, you were looking at the ocean. 
it was right there in front of you when you ate it. Fresh, That's fresh, the only fresh. sushi they ate was the sushi that came off the boat minutes before you. Uh oh, you locked up. He'll come back. Hey, Dion, if you can hear us, if you don't come back, click out, uh, close it out, and click back on that link, and you'll jump back in. And I, I wanted to show. We're talking about Japan, and this is the Pinky Deluxe. This is called the Pinky Deluxe. See, it says it right here. Oh, nope, there he is. He's back. We're back. I was getting ready to show off this fabulous swim bait that June sent us. Um. So let me let me go through this sucker real quick. It's pretty exciting. So this is the Pinky Deluxe. It's about nine inches long from nose to tail. That's the small one. This is the small one. Yeah, they make a triple deluxe. He makes a triple deluxe. That's quite a bit longer. Um, Dream Express Lures is the name of the company. It's got super sharp owner. By the way, I didn't tell you. Be careful with these hooks. They're yeah, like you, you super super that. sharp hooks. But the cool thing about this. So right now it's it's a big crankbait, right? It's got this is the long bill that it comes with. Dang, these hooks uh -huh. are sharp. So this June says this as it sits right now with the long bill, it it dives down to about eight feet, and you can take this bill, pop it out. Oh, how about that? And he comes with a short bill. So you've got this little shorter bill, and this bill actually has two different angles. So depending on how you put this thing in, you it, you can make like a, if you put it in this way, it's like more a like a, bait? it's more like a wake bait. Yeah. Or the other way, it, it dives down to about six foot and it has a lot more roll. Huh. So you got several different options right there, or you can leave it out and it's like a traditional glide type bait. Yeah. Um, he said. It's a slow float. It's a slow float. He said, if you want it to suspend. You can put, he told me exactly how many grams to put on each one of these sections. But basically, like if you, you can add like a suspender strip on each one of these sections of the bait. So it sinks, you know, well, actually, so it suspends horizontal um, instead of, you know, like a jerk bait this yeah. way. You want, it, you want it to sit just like this in the water column. It's got a ton of good action. Removable tails, too. I think he has nine different colored tails. The tail just comes right off the same way. So if you want yeah. something with a... You know, some chartreuse on there. You got some dirty water. Um, you can change that tail out. Really cool baits, though. I think there's only uh, one place in the United States that sells these, and that's, what's that? Carolina, Carolina Rod Marilla. Carolina Tackle LLC or something like that. Carolina, But you can look up Dream Express Lures <clears throat> online and, and check them out. But I haven't thrown it. I took it with me yesterday. And Did you get a little nervous? No, I just, we, we were just trying to find fish and i didn't i'm gonna take it out there by myself one of these days i'm gonna gotcha. put this sucker on live scope and i'm gonna see what it looks like under the water and see how fast it you know sinks if it suspends yeah. just play around with it for a while but really cool bait um i don't know how many colors he has like probably eight or ten you got another color there yeah. it's got a little more sharp tree so here's two different colors i you i you still my favorite color yeah i you that japan i you color I tell you what, in jerk baits, it's blueback herring. I mean, it is so close to a blueback herring that it, I mean, and it's a little minnow that they have over there in Japan, but I mean, that olive colored back, I used, I used just hell of a color. I mean, I catch yeah. them on it around grass in Texas. You know, I catch them on it here on a jerk bait. I mean, it's, it's just a beautiful color. And, and like I say, that, that totally came from, you know, Japan. They uh, when when we were over there, Daiwa had some some deep divers that uh, they didn't have in the states. Which it ended as it ended up, it was really close to a DD twenty two, and uh, but like I say, I love that IU color. Let me tell you something. When I started going to Lake Minnetonka in Minnesota, in some of those tournaments, oh yeah, I cratered them on that deal. You know, had about thirty of them between me and Dad. We had we'd called and got a few more and stuff like that had about 30 of them and, and every one of them lake minnetonka has taken from us in the form of them 40 and 50 pound muskies muskies uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah they poked holes in them and and took all of them and uh but it made a difference i mean i made the top five in every one of the bass's they ever had up there on lake minnetonka uh, wow they just ate it 
and it was more buoyant too. I mean, compared to any other any other crankbaits that we had. So you could crank that thing down in that grass, pull it into that grass, and just stop it, and hell, it'd pop right back out of that grass. And uh, but yeah, you any anything you show me on their baits over there. Oh yeah, they're so far in advance on a lot of that little technical stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just proud they don't mind us seeing it over here every now and then. Yeah, no kidding. They, they, they got stuff. You know, they got stuff that's very cool. Um, and, and like I say, the attention to detail is second to none. You know, just like having multiple tail colors. You know, stuff like that. That that's that makes a difference. I mean, it makes such a difference. You know, and and being able to take that one bait and do four or five different depths with it. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, there's, there's none of those swim baits like that in this part of the world. <laughs> so. No, and you know, another thing that I forgot to mention, it comes with this, it's, it comes with two little pieces of wire. And I thought these were just for the packaging to hold the swim bait, but they're not. They're actually a weed guard. So you take, see if I can do this. These hooks, God. To dangerous. hang down in front of that treble? Yeah. So you yeah. you basically you got to pull the lip out first, and then you thread these two pieces down through the pull point of the line tie. If I can get it through there, and then once it gets down right here, let me get it spread out real quick. It's kind of tricky to to get it just in the on the line tie, not the split ring there. This is the first time I'm seeing them tonight, so I'm still oohing and on over here. Over oh there. yeah, it's, so. trust me. There's there's lots of them little gadgets and stuff that's well thought out. I mean, you know, well, just I mean, just the design of it, the the craftsmanship of of what he's done to these baits, the small details of it, like you were saying, it's just we don't have anything like that in the states. No, they're stamped and produced faster than you can blink an eye. Yes, so. The United, the United States just wants you to buy three more. And we're really good at that. Oh, yeah, That's, absolutely. Especially as fishermen. Yes. Got to get spun around. Or trip. big eaters like yourself and me. We like double cheeseburgers and fries. Right. <clears throat> it's a little tricky. You I did it, it perfect the other night, the first time I tried it. I keep getting this split ring in the way. But essentially... It's going to look like that. Yep. So you've got these these wire weed, these weed guard hanging down there. It's kind of like two feet. Just it kind of defends down. that treble hook because that treble hook's going to be laying up a little bit further. Yeah. But you can you can work it around brush and stuff. So it's got the two different bill designs. Um, you got a wake bait, a wide wobble, then a deeper diver, and then if you take the bills out, it's a it's a swim bait or it's a s you know like an s glider bait, and then you've got this weed guard that you can add in there. So it's it's a, it does a lot of stuff, man. A lot of stuff. And I can't wait to go out there and play with that. And I know I'm not going to fish it on. Can, you were talking about muskies. We got a lake over here, Lake Kincaid. It's full of muskies. It will yeah. not touch water in Kincaid Lake. No, nope. 100% will not touch water. Nope. I, don't even, I don't even know about cedar. I'm worried about those stripers. We got a local lake that's got some 25-pound <laughs> stripers in there. I'm kind of scared to throw it around those fish. You know what? A little bit of that type of bait I've used, though, it really doesn't seem to matter on the line size. I mean, it, it seems like you can throw fairly big braid. Uh, I did a I did a deal just last weekend at Kansas City Boat Show with uh, with Chris Aldane, and I kind of quizzed him about that a little bit. You know, does you know does the line size make a huge difference? And uh, and he was no uses a lot of thirty pound uh, really mono and stuff. He said it really doesn't have an effect on the way the bait works or anything, you know. Mm. So, I mean, you know, what little I've thrown it, I never thrown on anything less than about 25. Uh, you know, in, in what little, I, I haven't had, I, I own two or three of them, and that's it, you know. Uh, you know, but after after spending the whole weekend up there listening to Zaldane's seminars and stuff, you know, I'm damn sure going to start trying them a little bit more, you know. I'm I'm dang sure going to get me a little handful of them. So I, you know, I got my gizzard shad, you know, my bluegill and all that stuff kind of covered, you know, with baits that I feel like 
you know, look good. Uh, and that was kind of the neat thing about listening to him. You know, he said it's it's a bait that you're not going to catch many fish on, so you better have confidence in what's going in the lake. You know, so he said if it looks good to you, if it's color that looks good to you, he said that's the one you'll catch them on. You know, he says if the bait wiggles just right and that's what you like seeing, he said that's the one you'll catch them on. Uh, you know. But I did pay attention to which ones he said were the perfect ones that he liked. So, yeah, yeah I'm, for sure. I'm not stupid. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, he catches more on than anybody else, uh, you know, out there on the circuit anyway. But he's – and, you know, if you would listen to his seminars, you could tell why he does because he just has enough confidence in it that, you know, if he can get five in the boat and he's got four good hours the rest of the day, he knows he can make one bite it. You right. Know? And it's probably going to be a dominant bass in that pond, you know. Right. So, you know, so he he understands. It, but, it's kind of one of those. It's like one of those baits you gotta like. You just you nailed it. You gotta keep it in your hand for a long time and cover some. Water. Yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna catch five on it in a day. Right. <laughs> don't don't think you are. You know. Don't you know? It's one of those deals where you're fishing for two bites. You know, but. But, you know, think about how many days you've been out there and you got about 16 in the boat and you're thinking, huh, man, I just need that one, you know, to put me over the top, you know. So, and, and I like fishing that way. I like fishing for big fish. I mean, I, I'm I'm terrible about it in tournaments, you know. You know, God forbid I catch a six or seven pounder in practice. Because if <laughs> I do, if I do, I better, you know, I better hope they're doing that pretty good. If not, I'm going to waste a lot of time in the tournament because, you know, I like getting cheered for. That's the way it is. I don't like standing up there. Oh man, another nice stringer. He's got 13 pounds. Get off stage. No, that ain't me. <laughs> no, I want to pull one out of the bag and everybody go, Ooh, oh, look at that. <laughs> you know, that's what I want to do, you know. And and if I only got two in the bag, trust me, if they're both six pounders, they're gonna ooh and ah more than somebody catching five that weighs 12. Right. You know? And I just that's how I got. That's how I got brought up. You know, we we caught big ones. We fished for big ones. Uh, you know, that's just the way Dad was. You know, Dad Dad won big fish in, in bass tournaments probably as much as anybody living, you know, still to this day, anybody still alive. Uh, and that's because he spent the bulk of his days fishing for them. You know, he, he thrived on catching big ones, you know. So, you know, he might weigh in too you know, but one of them might be an eight or nine pounder, you know, he just, he really, really loved fishing for big ones and, and, uh, which made us kind of somewhat average bass fishermen in some respects, you know, and all, there's lots and lots of times, you know, where it really hurt us, you know, uh, you know, but like I say, I, I like, I like hearing them cheer. I want to hear them clap. I want to hear them holler, you know, when you, when you get there on stage and pull one of them out of the boat, you know, it, it's, that's, that's what it's all about to me. Yeah. Everybody steps back two feet when you pull it out of the live well, because they're scared. Right. That's what yeah. it's all about. <laughs> we got 177 people on here. This is awesome. Um, wanted to remind everybody. We need to plug the, we need to plug the giveaway. We yep. do, we are going to be doing a giveaway here shortly. And the way the giveaway works is we are going to make a reference to Sasquatch. When you hear that keyword, guess a number between one and 200. Dion's already picked the number. I got it written down right here. And whoever guesses that number is going to win a prize pack from Hogs Custom Baits and Cumberland Pro Lures. So you'll be able to check out some, some new product. I'll send some good stuff your way. And I might even throw in, you talked about Zaldane. I, I might even throw in a Guggen bait. I got some Guggen crankbaits in there. All right. So I got some sitting around there. I might throw in a bonus Guggen crankbait Sounds for good. you guys out there. So keep your ears peeled for that. You were talking about Guido, and I was – you know anything about these, these ledge rock lures? Yes, I do. What's the story on these? I picked some of these up not too long ago, and I was curious about that, the story behind these. That is the last crawdad that my dad put together. Okay. Uh, you know, we've got a friend of ours. Uh, he worked with Lucky Strike for many, many years. Uh, when that all kind of went by the wayside – uh, he wanted to come back out and make make crawdads. Uh, and Dad says, well, you know, we can do it. And they sit down. They made it. Uh, there are several different, you know, several different options. 
you know, quite a few different variations of it. Uh, but the main main thing is, is, you know, we got the three right sizes of crawdads that we use on the back of our jig. Uh, but he makes several different other baits and stuff. But uh, he makes some custom stuff also that is second to none. I mean, you know, they're they're basically they're just painted up. I mean, when you look at it, you can drop it in the tank with a live crawdad. I can paint it and put my garlic markers to it. And when you see it laying on the bottom of a tank, you will think it's real. I mean, and, and it's just, he's taken the detail and put into the claws and, you know, the arms and everything. And, and uh, you know, and he just made it made it look right. It's right. right. It's it's yeah. a good looking bait. The one that I bought is the, it's the medium D chunk. Yeah. Man. Yeah. It's that's just for perfect. stringing on like a piece of pork. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. nice. It's a good looking bait. It's got the real exaggerated claws too. Yep, that is a that is an Ozark long pinchered crawl. Okay, I mean that's where it comes from. We we caught one the the crawl that he started with came out of Table Rock Lake, and he had it for a pet, and kept it for a pet for forever. I mean kept it in a fish tank, had it for several years, and uh, when he made when it died, he made a replica of it. And it was 11 inches long, the crawfish was. Are you serious? That's a lot. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something. You see one standing there on the bed? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things will make one jump and tackle it. You throw an 11-inch crawdad in there, let me tell you something. He's going to hit it. You might not hook him, but he's going to hit it, you know. And we've used it. Uh, we, we've actually sold a lot more of those big ones than you would ever imagine. You know, most of them are those California boys that fish for them on the bed a lot. Uh, but like I say, he makes several different sizes. Uh, he makes the most natural colors. You know, it, it's the best rubber crawfish trailer on the market. But yeah. me and Lawson work with him. We, we, you know, we got it on our jersey, and, and that's the one we fish with as far as crawdads goes. You know, I saw Ron on here a while ago, and he had uh... – he had mentioned that he, he was found some of his last Guido bugs. Yeah. And he's been cleaning out his plastics. Yeah. And I remember cleaning out over at dad's. This has been a couple years ago. And he was, he had a bag of here's for the grandkids. And I don't know if you can see that. If it'll focus. Just hold it still to focus. <laughs> I see dad's picture up in the left hand corner. Yeah. That's an old, old pack from Dunn's. And uh, yeah. I, I would imagine probably in Paducah. Yeah. Probably, probably yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I hung on to that one. I just threw that one in the uh, $2.49 yeah, a bag. That yeah. tells you how old it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I threw yeah. that one in the uh, the don't throw away box and don't let at the one, grandkids get a hold of it box. <laughs> at one point in time, Dunn's, we weren't sure they weren't eating them or something because they were buying <laughs> more damn crawdads than you could shake a stick at. I'm like, where are you guys throwing these, putting these things at, you know? But uh, yeah, Dunn's, Dunn's, and the, and the neat thing about it was that old man that uh, actually owned Dunn's down there at the Paducah store, he was a super sweet guy. And, and every time we went through that part of the world, we stopped in there and, and uh, because he had such an array of guns and stuff. And, you know, I bought no less than 30 freaking shotguns from that old man. So yeah, he made it back on my butt. You know, me selling him a few crawdads, yeah, we never got even on that deal, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, anyways, that's, you know, that, that old crawdad caught a lot of fish. I mean, when it, it was like anything else. When it first came out, it just looked good. And, I mean, it looked good on a bait, uh, you know, and people caught fish on it. You know, it was one of the better flipping baits that you could put on the back of a jig that wasn't a piece of pork. You know, so it was is one of them deals. You know, everybody had them, everybody bought them. Um, you know, and and like I say, it just looked good. You know, it looked right on the back of a jig. It wasn't it wasn't just something else to give it bulk or size. You know, it actually, you know, when you strung it on the jig right, you know, and and you let it down on the bottom, those legs would actually stand up off the bottom, and and you know that's a natural thing for that fish to see and. And, uh, you know, it just got you more bites. You know, you could catch more fish on it because they got more bites, uh, especially when it was slow, you know. Uh, 
everybody could catch them when they was biting a piece of pork. You know, right. uh, you know, heck, you throw a pine cone out there and catch them on the back of a jig for the most part when they're eating pork. Uh, now you're gonna really, I'm gonna really piss some people off saying that because there's still some people that's really super glad that pork came back out. Um, <laughs> now I'm gonna tell you right now, and this is my opinion of it: pork was out just long enough to tell me, okay, it doesn't make a difference. You know, uh, but my son, my son still believes in it. You know, he still carries a couple of jars of pork around with him. Uh, he just swears that when the water is really, really cold, that they might hang on to it a little bit better. And I tell him, you know, well, just take your gloves off so you can feel better. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, he hates it when I say that. But, you know, it's one of those deals. You know, I just I don't feel like it's that big an asset as, a, as you know, way back when, when you didn't have anything else, you know, yep, you throw the pork because it does have a nice flowing action. But if my jig's sitting on the bottom, there ain't no flowing action. So that's when I like that piece of rubber floating up off the bottom and giving them claws, you know. So, so we all have our opinions, but well, you're right. You're right on my parade. That's you know, mine, and mine's my right parade. for the most part. Then you just buy I just bought. I just bought support. Ron, my buddy Ron, who's on here, I've witnessed him catch. Did catch he? Did he whip your butt fish. on it? He's caught some fish. Yeah, on a on a, on a black and blue jig <laughs> with a black Uncle Josh number eleven, oh. and. I got to see it and I'm like, I'm okay, fine. I'm gonna pay like twelve dollars for three yeah. of those suckers. <laughs> you know, they do come in a plastic bottle now, so the cap the cap doesn't rust like it used to. And uh so I've been throwing that pork around a little bit. It's nasty. You get that dial over your hand, especially when uh, you try to take it off. It I'm just gonna horrible. tell you right now, I, I've got a son that he'll sit right here and argue with me right back and forth, you know. And I've been in the boat with him when he said, Hey, what do you think about that pork? And I said, hey, how about me run that trolling motor and let's see what you think about that part. Because you know? <laughs> that's normally the deal. Uh -huh. If he's leading us down the bank, yes, he might get a few more bites. But, yeah, as soon as I take over, I get the few more bites than he does. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but it, it's, that's like anything. I mean, that's whatever you think. Whatever gives you the most confidence, that's what you better be chunking in the lake. Uh, me personally, I got enough different color Guido bugs. I can make them look right. And I'm going to fish with that 99% of the time behind my jig. So you still got a few of those laying around, huh? Oh yeah. I got a couple. I got a couple. <laughs> my wife, we was in the, we was in the craft shop the other day and I bought me one of those needles that I used to stick that rubber through there with. And uh, she says, what are you going to do with that? I said, I just need to carry the boat with me. I said, some of my old baits are getting a little feeble and that rubber stretching out and getting nasty. And I just pulled it out and, Pull me some new stuff through there so it looks a little bit better. So, <laughs> Ron, yeah, you guys, you guys think that's not funny. You didn't have to string that thing through there like that. I had to so what, that what, you, what are you talking about? You take talking like little pieces of skirt the, material or something? Yeah, the skirt material that used to go through the nose and uh -huh. then it had a couple through the back. Oh yeah, that was strung through there with a with a needle like a needle type deal, like they used a crochet and stuff with yeah you had to pull huh. that stuff through there it didn't come out of way huh see you guys ain't even got the old originals no see, no you guys have got store-bought stuff yeah which there's nothing wrong with that we designed most of those too you know if it says guido bug on the belly yeah we had something to do with it um uh, but yeah the first ones that came out you know you just had the rubber crawl and then all the little pinchers and uh, not the pinchers but like his nose feelers that yeah. come off the nose oh yeah you had to put them in there yeah you had to put them in there i know i've spent millions of hours sitting stringing hundreds of thousands of those together so people could buy them and send my kids to school and stuff you know that's that was a lot of work way back when <laughs> yeah, way, before, way before my kids got came on the scene that's back when i was little uh oh yeah they're all handmade I'll have to get you all a handmade one one of these days. There's somebody watching this show right now that's got one. I promise you, you know. Oh, uh, I'm sure. Probably handy where they could put their hands on it. But well, I'll, I'll give anybody out there. Here, here's what I learned about pork two days ago or three days ago. I guess it was. I called my buddy Ron. He's the guy I was just talking about that got me into fishing pork. And I said, how in the heck do you get that pork off of the hook? Because it's cold. That day I was fishing, it was... 36 degrees cloudy the wind was blowing 20 miles an hour and at the end of the day 
I couldn't get I couldn't get it off. I'm like, screw it. I put it in the back of the truck. When I got back to the house, about two hours later, I called Ron. He said, what's the key? What's the key to getting this pork off of there? And he said, oh, you young kids. He said, there's a little slot in there. If you stick the hook down through that little slot and then to, to back it back off, you just turn your hook sideways and it'll pop right off. So here I am. I got dye all over my hands because mm -hmm. I'm squeezing so hard and pulling. I was scared I was going to cut my thumb open with the barb, you know, if I if it ever did break free. And uh, all I had to do is just put it on there the right way and then back it off. <laughs> so little, little uh, amateur tip there for you guys out there. I do. Remember, there is a little slit in there. I do remember that on the original pork that dad had that there was a hole there's, inside of there. There's and, a hole at the top of every one of them. Yep. I know now I got it. I, I rigged it up the other day and I got it in there right. And it, it's right on the tip too. It's not very far yeah. in there. It's just right, just yeah. barely yeah. inside of there. I remember hooked, bringing it up like a regular chunk like you did though. There wasn't no getting that off. No. And in the summertime, don't <laughs> even think about fishing in the summertime. No. It'll shrivel up like a piece of beef jerky in about yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> Hey, there was a comment on here. Pork should be, uh, what was it, fried, grilled, or baked, not fished with. That's right. I agree. <laughs> I'm with that dude. <laughs> so uh, what's going on down there at Lake of the Ozarks? Anybody been fishing down there? Oh, yeah, they're still biting. I mean, they've been biting. They're live scoping them. You yep. know, they're catching them 20 pounds a day, you know, is what they're catching. Uh Lawson, uh, two weekends ago, Lawson had 20. And then on Tuesday in the Angry Pirate Tournament, he had 20. Uh, I I don't think they had anything last weekend because of the snow kind of screwed it up and everybody canceled. Um, I'm trying to think of what them boys' name are up there at Warsaw. Uh, there's two brothers that's been doing really good. Um but they strictly live scope. They know all about live scope. They're very good at it. Uh, practice with it a lot. Um, that gel in Lawson it. for the most part. Uh, Marcus, Marcus won one on a jerk bait, uh, a bass and bob tournament, uh, you know, a couple weekends ago. Um, so, you know, it's, they've been jerk baiting them some. They'll have, they'll have a good jerk bait tournament and then they'll have a, you know, live scope tournament where they'll win and, uh, you know, but basically, you know, fish are in their wintertime stuff. They're, they're catching them on a rigs and, and jerk baits. And, you know, some days the jerk baits will suffer. And when that happens, the live scope guys will win, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, they're biting. I mean, uh, lots of, you know, quite a bit of little dirt jig stuff going on. They're catching them quite a bit. Uh, you know, you catch, it seemed like you can catch about 15 pounds and every now and then you'll catch a dang six pounder to go with them, you know? Uh, but you can catch 20 keepers in the day and not catch that six pounder. Uh, yeah. So, you know, 12 to 15, 16 pounds, you can catch that on a jig for the most part. Uh, and like I say, Dirk's jig has been about as good as you can throw, um, you know, and then like I say, a jerk bait and, Jerk baiting an A rig, you know, seems to be the see seems to be the main deal, you know, for the most part. So. You you throw that jerk's jig on a like twelve pound test. Do you have to drop down on line size, or do you do you still throw it on heavier line? No, I throw it on twelve. Twelve, you know, twelve's about as light as I go. Uh, yep, Dirk and them a lot of times they throw it on ten and eight and stuff like that. Uh, I don't ever do that, you know. I just throw it on twelve and and a little, little light bait caster. You know, uh, I throw it on a seven hook, seven foot kind of a medium rod, uh, one that's super sensitive, uh, you know, and 12 pound fluorocarbon. And that's, that's about the way I do it. I mean, you know, uh, some guys go down on spinning rods, you know, and throw it on 10 pound braid and an eight pound leader and stuff like that. But I, I think when you go to doing that, you're just kind of grasping at straws, you know, you yeah. just need to find a b better school of fish. You know, uh, I, I don't think you're getting more bites because of it, is my personal opinion. Um, and I've had Dirk in the boat with me several times. I mean, we fished together quite a bit. He's actually a super good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I've had him go out there with me and make him use the rig that he uses in January and February. And, and like I say, most of the time, 12-pound fluorocarbon is good enough, you know, for the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. There are times that spinning rods are nice, 
you know, a spinning rod's awful nice when your guides are freezing up. Uh, yeah. A lot of times compared to a bait caster, uh, you know, they just don't freeze quite as bad. I'll tell you another time when spinning rods are nice is when you have a snowstorm and you spend six hours shoveling your driveway and using one of those picks to pick off the ice <laughs> and then you go fishing the other the next day and your hands and your hand, you can't hardly hold your dang <laughs> real handle it's nice to have that spinning pole just sitting there in your uh -huh. hand yeah, that's I how it was all, yesterday all you do is call me and i can't would have came over man, with the my, dude my forearms were blazing <laughs> i couldn't hardly I, like my knuckles were all swelled is that up why all the pictures of the fish with your buddy and not you that's exactly right that's why that's I exactly right that's, that's why you buy your wife a four-wheel drive too don't <laughs> shove that crap just drive yeah. over it you know i, I had to get my I boat out i had to get my boat out I told my wife, I said, he'll park right up here by the porch if you want to. I don't care if you're in the driveway or not. You know, it didn't make any difference. Snow's not going to show. Well, know? it's funny when I pulled in while I go. So he's got like a path that's just wide enough for this jack wheel to roll out. You know, he just chiseled a little bitty path <laughs> out there. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, I got one of them old school garage doors that swing out in my lower garage. So I had, I had a big old pile of snow drift and ice drift up against that door and i couldn't get it open so i had to walk around and i spent it took me about 30 minutes just to get that cleared and i i got it cleared out enough to where i can i can roll that <laughs> boat out a little bit and then narrow it narrowed down then i can roll it up and, and hitch it up to the truck and that's all that was it now the upper driveway was pretty good you know it was kind of slushy so it wasn't too bad i'm gonna tell you how bad it was with me my wife redid our sidewalk because my path what i consider a path and what she considers path, two different things. All right. <laughs> My path, you better not have much of a swagger to you, or you're going to get step in the snow. Simple <laughs> as that. You know, her path, you know, Andre the Giant could have walked down through there. You know, <laughs> or Sasquatch could have walked down through there. He wouldn't, uh -oh. have, wouldn't have changed anything. See, I'm tired of waiting. I've got to see who's going to win this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, speaking of, because you just dropped the, dropped the word here, you got a story? A Sasquatch story? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you don't want me to tell you that thing about Peyton again, do you? Oh, yeah. I do, man. Oh, yeah. I do. Oh, now he, he'll Seriously. probably kill me over this. But well. We were, at, we were at Kentucky Lake, okay? Uh, now, before, after I, before I tell you this, I'm just going to tell you, if you know anything about Sasquatch, look up Land Between the Lakes. Tons of sightings and stuff. All kinds of creepy things happen on land between the lakes. All right. Well, my son was in Kentucky Lake, way up towards Paris, and on the land between the lake side, way up in a creek. All those creeks do the same thing. They go up in, they're big wide bays, but there's always a little creek that takes off and runs a couple miles up in the woods. Peyton was up in one of them. He had went way up in that creek, caught a few fish, and got way up in one to where about to where he couldn't get his boat turned around got up in there and he heard something walking through the water ahead of him so he's a natural hunter i mean he's hunted and fished his whole life so he stopped to listen and uh needless to say when he stopped and quit making any noise at all with his boat he heard it stop and he thought oh that's a little creepy you know it knows i'm here and uh and so he sat there for the longest time, and it never did anything. And uh, so he decides, well, he's going to creep on forward a little bit. So he hits the trailer motor and goes moving on forward. Well, as soon as he does, it starts moving again. And he said it definitely sounded like it was a person. And, and you know, he didn't think anything about it. He's a big old burly bugger just like me, you know. And, and uh, then the first thing you know, he hears like two rocks clacking together. When he hears these two rocks clacking together, he's like, hey, I have heard that noise when dad watches YouTube sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, so he stopped dead in his tracks, just quit going. He's like, wait a minute, that's weird. Even if that is some old boy up there guarding his still or something, clacking two rocks together, that's not natural, okay? He doesn't sit there 30 seconds after it clacked those rocks together Till back down the creek behind him, he said, might have been four or 500 yards. It's a long way back down the creek. Something starts clacking rocks together back there. So he's thinking, okay, now I'm in between these two things, you know. 
And he said they were clearly communicating. Whatever they were, whether it was rednecks or whether it was Sasquatch, they were clacking two rocks together. So he goes to backing down that creek as fast as he can until he can get his bass boat spun around. And uh, when he gets her spun around, he said, making all that racket, you know, with his trolling motor and stuff, he said, really hadn't heard a whole lot. And uh, he said, so he sat there for just a minute after he got spun around, and he's got everything laid down. He's laid his rods in the boat down and everything, strapped them down, because he's thinking, if I'm going to get eaten by a Sasquatch, he's going to have to do it with me on plane. And uh, so he sits there and listens a little bit, and he said the next time he heard the rocks clack together, they're about 100 yards from him, one on one end of him, one at the other end of him. So he sat down, he fired up that mercury, and he jumped his camus up on plane, and he drove it out of that little narrow creek, you know, and left out of there on plane. He said some of the turns were so sharp that he roostered up on the bank and got up on the bank, and he <laughs> said, but at no time did I ever lose plane, and he says, I drove that some gun clean out. And uh, so, yeah, that's the only time that any of my crews ever been close to a Sasquatch. <laughs> but... Uh, and that may have not been what it was, but since then, uh, he got in and he came right straight to me on the water, which he never does. You know, when we're out there practicing, we don't, we don't talk till we get to the way to the launch ramp. And, uh, he called me and he came right straight to me. And when he came right straight to me, I thought, hmm, he's buggered up. <laughs> something, something has happened, you know, and he drove right straight to me and he goes to telling me the story. And while I'm sitting there on, I'm sitting there, I pull out my phone and I just put up Land Between the Lakes, Sasquatch. There's thousands of stories about Land Between the Lakes <laughs> and it, creepy critters like that. And uh, and needless to say, he, I don't think he ever fished in there the rest of the week. I mean, <laughs> he says, man, I sure am glad I didn't find him over there. So, <laughs> yeah, he fished on the, he fished on the other side of the lake the whole rest of the week. I bet he, he did. did. I bet he, he put as much water as he did. In the that, so, that creek. And, yeah. <laughs> well, we do have a winner. Oh, sweet. Cody. Cody Domes. Congratulations, Cody. That's cool, man. Number 16. That is cool. Sweet. I will, uh, I'll get that out to you sometime this week. That's a good deal. Yeah, those those uh, Sasquatches were probably saying that's a really nice looking Camus there. That is a sweet looking Camus. That's a sweet looking got, Camus. Got wanna... that pretty blue wrap on it. You yep. know. Yeah, they you probably look good right now. Well, he, you know, it may have been one of them rednecks back in there looking for a new recipe. Uh, that that could be too. Because that I mean, recipe, he's a big, he's a big woolly bugger too. I mean, he might have been looking for a boyfriend. You never know. <laughs> you never know. You know that? I mean, he, we, they, I mean, they call him. They called Peyton Sasquatch when he was in school, when he played in sports, because he's got hair everywhere on his body. I mean, <laughs> pretty much from the neck down, he's covered. He's covered, you know. So They might, they might have, have thought it was him. a long-lost cousin or something. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm telling you. Oh, I'm that is you. good stuff. That is good stuff. Well, that that uh, that 10 cup whiskey is some good brew, too. So It's not too bad. It's not too bad. I enjoy it myself. I enjoy it myself. If I didn't have four jigs tomorrow, I'd be indulging right now. <laughs> so if I pour jigs, it blurs my vision up a little bit. And I get to pouring lead, and I, I just, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. If I, you might burn if I a finger. Yeah, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. And you definitely don't want to be drinking it while you're doing it, because if you spill any of that liquid into that lead. Oh, yeah, it blows up. It's a bad deal, I promise. It's a very bad deal, yes. Yeah, if you've never seen that happen. See, there's nothing you guys can talk about making fishing lures or something like that that I haven't done. All right. Well, done, and tried, or screwed seen, up, right? I have screwed it all up at one point in time, you know. So, yeah, you pour too much water in that rubber, making them crowdheads, and all that does is bubble up, boil over. You drop a drop of water in lead and it explodes. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the way, it's going to go clean to the bone. Yeah, it, it doesn't have any, uh, any care of what it hits either. No. Nah. No, it eats whatever it gets to. So, are you pouring your own your personal stash tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I'm actually working on some little stuff. You know, I still pour a lot of our, you know, our little jigs and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I still like to put my own hooks in them and and you know configure them around to where I I like them just right. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's definitely something that we still do a lot of. Uh, are those custom you know, molds that you're using? 
Uh, some of them. Some okay. of them, yes. Yeah. Some of them are head designs that we put together. Uh, some of them are just regular old do-it molds that uh, that I put together, put my hooks in them right, you know. Uh, maybe change my weed guard angle or something like that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, a lot of hooks and stuff that I definitely think are better than what you can buy on the market, you know, that what you can just buy and buy in a jig, you know, and, and I've always, we've always made a lot of that stuff. You know, we, we put the hook in it that we think is the perfect hook for that, you know, process. Um, you know, it's just like a Dirk's jig, you know, the whole key to that whole little deal is the little hook, you know, that little hook is perfect, you know? Uh, so, and it makes a difference. It just makes a difference on landing fish, you know, hooking them, catching them, and trust me, boys, that's what we're all about, you know. That's right. You got eight hours to do it. Don't lose none, you know, and that's that's one thing that my dad was always, you know, you know, he was always picky on everything that he put in the water, you know, as far as, you know, making the perfect one to where he hooked every one that bit him, you know, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's important to us still, you know. Yeah, I started not- dabbling in that building jigs a couple years ago, and I haven't, the only jigs that I have are either Cumberland pros from Gabe or stuff that I've made. And it's just, there's something, you know, like you said, putting your own components in there, making it your own, but there's also something to be said about catching something on something that you built. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I take great pride. I take great pride in everything I put in the water, you know, that Cumberland pro stuff. uh, You know, I bought a bunch of it at one point in time, uh, out at Lake Cumberland. I'm sure it's the same company. Um, and, and the reason we bought them out there is because they had some really, really cool c- color combinations on their jig skirts. Uh, you know, most jig skirts, if they've got two colors in them, that's about it. But uh, a lot of their stuff at that point in time had three and four colors in it. And uh, and it looked awesome, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's just, that's something that I you know, I'm, I'm going to look at when I see stuff hanging on the rack. If it's got three colors in it, somebody took some time to make it look like what you want to be fishing with. Uh, you know, because just throwing three colors in a jig skirt, eh, that's a waste of your time for the most part. But if you lay them in there just right to where, you know, you got a dark back, you know, then a slightly dimmer midsection and then the belly being something like a brighter belly, you know, that's, that's, that's going to the links that you need to go to, to make it look right. Uh, you look, look for that peg. It's only got a couple left on it. Yeah. yeah. When you're at a local tackle shop. <laughs> and they got a cool little flipping jig too. Oh um, yeah. The one flipping jig that they make in like a three eighths, it's got a little bit smaller hook in it than what you see in a lot of the flipping jigs. Yeah. And it's not super, super heavy, but it's, it's just right. You know, you can still throw it on. 15 17 pound line it's it's just a really really good good jig you know that, um, that yeah they make a pro caster jig which is what you're talking about it's got a i believe it's got a three aught gammy in it and it comes through rock excellent the first time i really fished it in in rock was a couple of years ago down there on lake of the ozarks and uh my buddy mike was in the front of the boat he was throwing a certain type of jig and just getting hung up quite a bit and i and i went like i think i went I think in two hours I only got hung up a couple times and we was fishing all different kinds of rock. So, you know, you know how it is with there's certain head designs that just come through rock better than other head designs. It's because that eyes recess down in the head a lot. Too. Yeah. Yep. It's That's got really a lot. Low. It's just barely exposed out of the lid. That makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. The ones I make tomorrow will be very similar when it comes to that's how the hook comes out of them, you know, um, you know, and you just figure things like that out over the years, you know. Uh, and when you do, you know, some of the ball head stuff that I throw, it's just as common as as anything. I mean, you know, it's nothing special. But, you know, a lot of the other stuff, it all has its own little place, you know, and, and I believe in it. So so every year we got to sit down and make up about 100 of each, and, and uh, that way we got them in our stuff and we can – Tie them up as we like them and, and get them right. You know what the trick, I, I was just thinking, I was just re- recollecting yesterday because I caught some fish on, on that Cumberland Pro jig. But the key, the key moment, that the changing moment of our day was when Josh 
threw a mega bass jerk bait 20 feet up in a tree and he broke it off and we hadn't caught a fish before that as soon as he broke it off we started catching fish was that like a blessing to the fish guy i don't know i, I think it was a sacrifice like a donation or yeah there's sacrifice. a 25 dollar jerk bait and it's like 30 feet up in a tree he was throwing one spinning rod the wind it was really windy it's one of those deals where it got away from him but he had gloves on uh-huh and he didn't get enough meat on the, you know, on the line, and it just barely kind of ticked it, and it just, it was gone. We got underneath it, and we're looking up at it, and it's like there's nothing we can do. I would, you know, unless unless he wanted to get off on the bank and trespass and try to climb up a tree, <laughs> it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Oh, so, but I, after that, we caught fish. I sent my best friend up a tree at Beaver Lake one time. <laughs> it was it was one of one of only two that we had in the right color. And it was a Japanese-made one, and I sent his ass up a tree to get it back. <laughs> yeah. He picked it up and throwed it while I wasn't looking. I looked back, and he says, well, I'm hung. I turn around and look at what Roddy's got, and I'm like, uh, is that a little green back one? He said, yeah, I think so. I said, guess what, dude? You're climbing that tree. <laughs> yeah, he climbed the tree. He had to go up there and break a limb off, you know, right in somebody's yard. And he said, what if I send a dog out? I said, oh, you're probably going to get bit, but you're going up there and getting my bait, you know. Yeah, and he did. He plumbed up there and he got it back. That's great. But yeah, it's you know, I, I think a lot of people get to this time of the year. Uh, one of our best fishing days, and I told you guys about this the last time. One of our best fishing days last year in February ended up being on a little jig, and it was about two to three foot deep is where we got the bulk of our bites that day. And the way we figured it out was we saw a blue herring walking along, picking up crawdads. He was walking along the bank, picking up crawdads. And, uh, and I, I, you would have never got me to believe that, you know. And I put Lawson out on the bank. We jerked the troll motor up. And he got out on the bank. I said, okay, see what he's eating. And he walked down the bank maybe two steps away from the boat. And he said, well, there stands one. And I said, Stan's what? He said, oh, this little crawdad. And he caught it, you know, pretty slow in February. Them crawdads, right. they don't move around too fast. <laughs> he just reached down there and caught that one. And while he's bent over, he reaches over here to the side and catches another one. And he's got two different crawdads in his hand, both of them about that long. They they couldn't be, they couldn't be, you know, an inch long. But uh, found two of them just immediately. And needless to say, we backed out in the boat. I got down. Found a little jig, a little teeny tiny jig, strung crawdad on the back of it, and those fish were up there eating them too. I mean, they were up there. Everybody else, anytime somebody came around us, we just backed out off the bank and, you know, started throwing a jerk bait, you know, and and uh, as soon as they'd get away from us, we'd scoot right back in there on that little old rocky bank. But just a bright sunshine had pulled them out a little bit, you know, pulled them out on the top of them rocks, and and uh, they were there. And huh. and I. You know, before then, you would have made me believe that. But, I mean, we seen an old blue herring walking along the bank picking them up. That's how it was yesterday for us. We, we, uh, water was 37 degrees. Oof. All the big fish that we caught were less than five foot of water. Yeah. Yep. Clear water, too. You know, it's probably five foot of visibility right on the edge of the grass. Um, we had a, I guess our best, our best five was about 19 pounds. And we weighed, we weighed the three big ones. We had, uh, I think we had a five. Well, we say we. Josh caught all the big ones. Um, I was I was holding I was holding him in position so he could make an accurate cast. It just, you know, it was my boat. I was just trying to help him out. But I think he had a five two and a four something and a, another one that was right at four. And then we had some, you know, nice three and a half, three and three quarter pound fish. But pretty good day for thirty seven degree water. But those fish yeah. were right, right off the grass. I mean, like in four or five foot of water. Uh, oh. We caught some fish out deeper, a little bit deeper, but I, I think it was just like you said that sun had had warmed up. It was just warming up that shallower water just a little bit more, and they they pulled up in there. And I think they it was kind of like they were sun tanning on the beach or something. I think they like yeah. that feel that sunshine on their back. Uh, I think that like, was the key. I think they're like us. I mean, they like a little little heat every now and then, and that's you know they'll slip up there in a blank if they can. Mm-hmm. I mean, Let's I've always some questions been, here. I've always been a big believer in that. Yeah, you got to check it. You just never know. And I caught, I caught a, 
I caught a bass on a swim jig in 37 degree water. Wow. That was the highlight of my day. I love I love fishing swim jig, but prior to that, I think my my PB cold water bass on a swim jig was either 43 or 45 degree water temp. But I blew that out of the water yesterday with the 37 degree water temp bass. I, that was the highlight of my day. I was now just, you just got to catch one through the ice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it, the thing of it is with cold weather is that a rig blew everybody's theories out of water. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause they will chase baits very fast and eat them, you know? So, you know, to me, you know, everything that I used to think was the gospel. Mm -hmm. Nope. Not necessarily when they want it, they'll come get it, you know? Well, yeah. live scope changes a lot of that too. You can see what they're doing down there. Oh yeah, you know, and and they do the bulk of the time stand around. You know, yeah. they do stand more, but still, when it's time for them to swoop out there and get something, oh yeah, they're still just as aggressive. I mean, it's just got to look right to them, and they're they'll come and eat it. That fish hit that swim jig. He hit it about fifteen, well, probably about twenty foot from the boat. It was just a typical swim jig bite where it just kind of goes light. You feel just a little tick or whatever. And I, I hooked into him and I couldn't keep up with him. Really? 37 degree water. He was swimming at the boat as fast as I could reel at the seven yeah. to one year ratio. It's like you caught him in, in April. Yeah. Or... Like the water was 65 degrees or huh. something. So yeah. just like you said, man, when they want to come alive, they can come alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brock's got a question for you. He Let's says, how it. does Dion fish the concrete wake breakers at Lake of the Ozarks? How do I? Yeah. Uh, well, that's more of a fall deal for me. Uh, if you're talking about the break breaks deals that's out in front of the docks and stuff. Uh, yeah. It's more of a summertime, summertime and into the fall. Uh, and when I say into the fall, you know, shoot, clean up into November, December sometimes. Uh, but it's while a lot of those fish are still suspended real bad uh, and chasing shad. Uh, you know, those big wave breaks are just something that those shad will cluster up around. Uh, you catch a lot of fish, you know, catch a lot of spotted bass. Uh, the neat thing about it is every now and then you catch five or six pound largemouth. You know, there's there's a lot of times them old biggins will cruise out there. I think they know because there's just a lot of a lot of food gets around. You know, they really get clustered up with those shad. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not sure why the shad gather up on them as bad as they do. Uh, other than it's just a good piece of cover further off the bank than anything else, you know. But uh, most of that for me is is in, you know, September on up into the fall uh, is when I catch them around them wave breaks and, and them rock deals out there. Uh, now, I catch them off the cables on them a lot of times uh, earlier in the summer, you know, because they got to anchor those things down. And they actually anchor them down with a lot more cables and stuff than even boat docks. Uh, so there's lots of stuff hanging down off the bottom of them. Um, you know, so that's what you got to think about is what it looks like underneath it. Uh, it's not just a big piece of concrete floating out there in the middle of the lake. There's all kinds of things going towards the bottom, hanging off of it. Uh, and, you know, anytime you get something like that, that's just a... You know, that's like a tree standing there to a bass. You know, it just gives them something to stand on. Uh, so just think about that. You know, look for where them cables come off. Look for how they go in the water. You know, and, and that's, you know, you'll catch fish around them cables too. June says he still has some of the tube baits that you and your dad gave him a long time ago. He probably, he, I, I didn't check, but he probably cleaned out our tackle boxes when we left. <laughs> yeah. No, we, yeah. we, we've been in contact with June since then and before then. And I know we've, I know he's got some baits and since, you know, we got some stuff, but, uh, but yeah, we had a great time together. He was a, he was a peach of a guy to, to be around. Uh, I, I just heard somebody else. Maybe it was Al Dane. It had come in contact with him or something about some of these baits and different things. I'd say that's what it was, but, but anyways, yeah, I'm shoot. I miss hearing from him. I ain't heard from him in a long time. So I'm glad you guys are communicating with him. He's making some pretty cool stuff over yeah. there. Oh, He's absolutely. making some pretty cool stuff. Absolutely. The, Always has. If I can say this right, the Cusson, Cusson, Cusson jig. It's a little, 
it, it means umbrella in, in Japanese. And that's a yeah. new little like finesse jig that he's been making. Pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Uh, they, make, they make beautiful stuff. Yeah, and he's got a scrounger head too called the uh Franken Franken jig. Franken, Franken jig, Franken. Franken jig, I think. It's like a it's a oh. really unique scrounger <clears throat> head jig that he's working on. It's pretty cool. Uh Christopher <laughs> says best techniques or baits for the month of April and early May at Lake of the Ozarks. You know, come that time of the year, you can't beat a Carolina rig. Uh and when I say that, um uh, it's an extremely efficient way of catching them. Uh, I, I do the same thing with a little jig about half the time, throw it in the same places, uh, throw my jig in the same areas like you would throw a Carolina rig, like on little secondaries and stuff like that. Uh, you know, towards April, you're getting back in the creeks a little bit more than main lake stuff, uh, you know, especially April to May. Um, you know, those fish are thinking about spawning. Some of them will spawn in April a little bit, but for the most part, it's the full moon in may first of first of may um so it's hard to beat a carolina rig and when i say that if we go out fishing a tournament or something like that until we get that first limit in the boat one of us is going to be throwing a, a carolina rig a lot uh, you know i don't worry about the bait too much i throw a lizard on it i throw a fluke on it a lot of times uh sometimes i throw a french fry you know it just depends on kind of what they want to eat uh i sling it up in between the docks uh if I'm going to throw it around the docks and stuff like that, a lot of times I'll go down to like a half ounce uh, just so I can direct my cast a little bit better. And I shorten my leader up a little bit that time of the year. Uh, but it's an awfully efficient way of getting fish found quick. Um, you know, that's when your crank baiting is doing good most of the time too. You know, wiggle warting, shad wrapping, stuff like that. Um, you know, but... For the most part, I'm starting also to start target fishing a lot, throwing at a place where one should be spawning. Uh, so that's a little brown jig time for me. You know, I, I pitch pitch where I think one's going to be standing on the bed uh, a lot. And I start most of that with a jig, you know, throwing a little jig around. I don't worry about throwing tubes and stuff too much until I can visually look at them. Uh, and then sometimes I go to a tube. Uh, but for the most part, that's a swinging time for a little brown jig, you know. And and when I say that, you can just keep it that simple. Brown with a green pumpkin crawdad on the back of it. Put a little orange on the painters and get to it, you know. And you're going to catch as many fish as 90% of the guys out there. Um, but pitch them where you think they're going to be spawning. Uh, I, ca I catch very few fish that I look at, okay. The bulk of the fish that I catch during the spawn are the ones that everybody ain't looking at. Uh, and and that's hard to do because everybody wants to see them. Oh, man, I, if I could just find one five-pounder to look at. Yeah, for the most part, when you do find it, it's looking at you too, mm -hmm. and he's not that easy to catch. So you're better off to catch the ones you can't see. So I just throw the likely-looking places. You know, I skip that jig up there real quiet and likely-looking places and, and uh, you know, hope that he is standing there and, but like I say, if you can see him, he can see you, and he's not very easy to catch in that, that for instance. But, but that's, that's what good. I fish with that time of year. That's why I like finding that dirty water that time of the year. You betcha. You betcha. The dirtier, the better. What about? It's, it's, it's all, you know, you know, even on the Carolina rig, you're still catching them off the bed spawning, you yeah. know, during the full moon in May. Uh, but, you know, it's just a good, subtle way to fish, you know, that, you know, a fish will eat it, you know, so. You throw that on a braid? Huh? You, do you throw, you throw a Carolina rig, do you, Carolina rig, do you use braid or do you use uh, fluorocarbon? Most of the time I use straight fluorocarbon. You okay. know, I'm not a big, I'm not a huge braid fan for the most part. I do throw it on a spinning rod and I do think it's the best way to throw a spinning, spinning equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just because of line memory and that it, it lasts good on a spinning rod. Uh, but I always tie me a fluorocarbon leader in it. Uh, could you do that with Carolina rig? Yep, sure you could. I mean, you could use braid to your swivel and then just use a leader. Uh, I just don't. You know, that no stretch is not your not your friend all the time. You know, sometimes, you know, you need a little bit of stretch in that line when you go set the hook, especially if you're up shallow and you're around cover and stuff. And, 
you know, you don't you don't want to just be able to pour the coals to him completely, uh, you know, because you're gonna straighten out hooks, you're gonna tear big holes in his mouth, you know, and you know, like on a Carolina rig, you don't really need to set the hook all that hard, you know, because right. most of the time he's eating the whole dang thing, you know, just pull it into him and and wind him to the boat, you know. Uh, but that's my opinion. Yeah, I've been I've been experimenting around with with braid on the fluorocarbon, and it's it's hard to, it's kind of hard to get used to for me. I, I think I, I think I'm going back to, to fluorocarbon. See, that's what you, you just said it right there. It's hard for you to get used to. And uh, you think it's hard for you to get used to. See all this gray hair? Yeah, that's not easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for me to just change everything about the way I fish, no, I'm not going to do it, you know, uh, because you don't gain that much by using, like on a Carolina rig, you don't gain I don't feel like you gain much of nothing. You know, it's a little bit of sensitivity, but but still, you know, I don't think you're gaining that much. And if you're throwing that far with a Carolina rig that you need that braid for hook set and stuff, you're throwing too far, okay? You're not playing the odds, you know? The odds are you need to be closer to him anywhere because if you have to drag him that far on anything, you're going to lose him sometimes, you know. And they will they will jump, too. Yes, yes they're going to come off, you know. So yeah. just get closer to him, you know. Uh, that time of the year, though, I'm not making those long casts, though. Even if I am on little secondary points, I'm not making big old long casts because you just don't need to. You know, you got to just scoot up closer to him, you know. Uh, I like that. It makes sense. I, I just, the further you got to wind him, the better the chance is of him getting off. So, you, you know, when you say, oh, well, I'll throw braid and I'll set the hook on him 50 yards out there. Yeah, you still tore a big hole in his mouth because there's no stretch. And then you got to drag that big hole all the way back to the boat. Yeah. You know, that's a long ways. And at some point in time, he's going to run at you and jump. And all that loose stuff is going to come right yep. out of that hole that you tore in. You know, and even worse with the Carolina rig yeah, when it, they get that weight going. Yeah. You know, it, it's just, I'm a, I'm a small barb hook fisherman you know i i you know i believe that you you create most of the fight in how you pull him into the boat you know uh you know yep i still set the hook way too hard sometimes but for the most part i pull it into them they don't even know their hook till it's too late you know uh i i got them i got them worked away from the piece of cover they're around before they even know their hook you know and and that's something that my dad did for years. You know, he would pitch in there to a piece of cover, and he's like, "Oh, there's one," you know. And you're like, "You're gonna get him?" And he's like, "Yeah." As soon as he swims away from that tree, you know, <laughs> and he would just hold on to him. How many times does that happen to you, though? You know, you pitch in there and you don't know you got bit. Yeah. He swims right away from that piece of wood. Ninety nine percent of the time, he's going to swim away from whatever he's standing in. Okay. Well, if he swims that far away from a tree, he's not going to turn around and go back in it. He's not going to go back in it because he wants to fight. As soon as he goes to pulling, he's not going to fight in that tree. He wants to be in the open so he can swim and pull. And and very seldom, the only bass that will ever drag you back into a tree is a great big one. And that's after you've had him on for a little while. The bulk of that fight is going to happen in the open. And if you let him swim a foot, he's out, you know, 99% of the time he's over that limb or he's out of that tree, you know, and then you got a good chance at landing it, you know, it, it, it's nothing that takes any patience. It's just something you got to think about when one bites you, you know, if you hang on to him, he's swimming away from it. Just hang on to him, let him swim and then set the hook on, him, you know, hmm. but JT's got trust a question. Me, trust me. When you first go fishing, after you've been sitting in the cold for a couple of months, that's almost impossible. Yeah, that's you just okay. want to jerk off. Yeah, you want to jerk. You're gonna on jerk it. the first time something breathes on. You yeah. know, you're gonna jerk a lot of times that you ain't got nothing on there. You're like, that's you know, right. You're gonna look at your friend and oh yeah, he was there. You know, no, it wasn't. You're <laughs> that right. was a heck of a bite. Yeah, yeah he bumped that's it. Right, you know, uh, but yeah, once you get, once you realize that he's swimming away from that piece of cover, almost every time he bites it, you're gonna land a lot more fish. Makes total sense. Total sense. She's got to See, be even you guys learned something. I mean, come I on. I did. That's right. So See, it's at least the, the third. It's at least the third thing I've learned tonight. Yeah, I think. yeah. I think. 
You even learned past, so good. Yeah. Even past that Sasquatch clicking them rocks together, you know. Yeah, I learned that. I learned about pork. Pork's so good. Learned, learned some live scope stuff. Yep. And learning now about the about the other thing. What about the black lava rock down there on Lake of the Ozarks? What makes it so special? And what time of the year does it play? That's what JT was going to ask in here on the screen. Well, probably what makes it work more than anything is those warmouth uh, bluegill that live around it. Okay. Uh, those those little black, you know, dark dark black warmouth that have the blue specks on them. You know, they got little tiny blue specks on them, but they almost look black when you pull them out of the water. They thrive around that stuff, and trust me, that's a big old bass's big time forage. And another thing is, is that that big rock like that almost always is sporadic. It, it never grows like all together. It's like got big holes in it and it's, you know, it's porous. It's got holes through it and around it and, you know, and it's jagged. Well, what happens is, is those gizzard shad move in there on all banks. Shoot, they first start on pea gravel. But as they get eaten... As the fall progresses on, they start finding banks where they can get behind the rocks and up in the rocks. And once they have to do that, they have to start getting to those kind of rocks because uh, those are the kind that, you know, are sticking out off the bank three, four, five foot, you know, in places. And uh, it allows those gizzard shad to get up there and basically get a little bit better chance, you know, not getting eaten all the time. Uh but that's a lot why those rocks are, you know, a big deal to those fish is because those gizzards, as they progress through the fall, they finally realize, OK, I can get behind those. You know, I can get up close to the bank or they'll get in a little wet spot, you know, not even, you know, barely can't even get a bait to land in there. You know, uh, that's why my buzz bait at the end of the day, I, I go through two or I go through at least a couple of a couple you know, crocker gators a day, you know, because I throw them up in the rock, I throw them up on the bank before I start whining and it's going to end, it's going to be on the bank. Every cast is going to hit on the bank. And it's because those, a lot of times those fish are standing there where it's absolutely no water, you know, and if you land on top of him, you're spooking a circle, shoot twice the size of me, you know, laying yeah. there in the water if you land right on top of them. So just throw the dang thing up on the bank. Throw it up on the beach and then start it, you know, start winding it, you know. Uh, putting a horny toad on the back of it, that just makes it even nicer because that horny toad kind of cushions the blow. You know, I find that I go through a few less, a few less, uh, you know, buzz baits in a day with a horny toad on it than I did a skirt. Uh, that's because that lead's not making direct contact with the bank every time. Um, but, you know, it's just... You know, I'm throwing it up there on the back sides of them black rocks and throwing it up on the bank because I know where those fish can live, you know. And you guys do too. You've seen it happen. You've made a cast and your bait hits the water and the fish literally hits it before it gets to the water. You know, it yeah. sees it coming and it slashes at it as it's hitting the bottom, you know, hitting hitting in the lake. And uh, and guess what? About half time, you miss him. You know, he didn't get it good because he didn't see it good. But he just was hitting at it. But if you throw that up on the beach and pulled it out to him, then he'd have had a little bit more time to think about it to get it, you know. Because that first crank or two or the first turn or two of the blade, you know, it's still, you know, it's in that much water, you know, that little tiny, you know, inches of water until it gets on out there at about that deep. And when it gets to be five or six inches deep, okay, that's deep enough for a four pounder, you know. Uh, but that lava type rock, that black rock, is the stuff that kind of sets off the bank a little bit deeper. Uh, a lot of times it'll have a little bit of that pea gravelly stuff mixed in with it. You know, it's not, you know, just a solid rock bank is not perfect. The perfect bank is when you got them little light colored spots in that rock sitting around. When you see that little batch of gravel in the, in the mix of that rock and stuff, that's the perfect places, you know, but the whole reason they get on that rock is because it sits out in the water a little bit deeper. It sits a little got, bit further off the bank. I've seen that in like in early spring, you'll see those fish get up really shallow. You, you'll you'll spook it, them. They're looking at the bank sometimes. Fishing pressure, fishing pressure will put put them up in there too. You know, they'll get up there where they're not being thrown at. 
Hmm. You know, you think about where 90% of the jigs hit, you know, until you get to a really steep grade of bank, 90% of the jigs hit out, you know, hit right. slightly out off the shore. Yep. Okay. Well, if you fish for them enough, they'll eventually move up there where they're not getting thrown at, you know, and they'll be up there and nothing, you know. Yeah, you'll pitch your jig in there and you'll see a big boil on the bank. You know, oh, well, there was a carp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rethink that. <laughs> you know, that ain't always the case. But, you know, that that's, you know, the only reason I know it's because I fished for them my whole life here, you know. And and those type of banks are good in the springtime also. Absolutely. Uh, but for the most part, the reason they're so good is because they, that jaggedness stretches on out in the water a little way. You know, on out there, a lot of times four or five foot deep, you know, uh, the best white bass points are the best, you know, whopper plopper buzz bait points also, you know, and it's because of that big black rock because it's just, it gives the food a better place to hide. You know, when they're up there dirt shallow, they ain't got many places to go, you know, they got to find something to hide around. Well, if that rock juts up off the bottom, that gives them a little bit of place they can duck down into, you know. Yeah. Um, like a little fence, kind of like a little fence. Yeah, it's just someplace a little bit better for them to hide. Ryan See, says, "You uh, guys learned something else there." I too. did, man. I'm I'm writing them down. Full, right full of knowledge. I'm running. I'm running out of fingers, man. Your I'm hands running out still of fingers. <laughs> Ryan says, "Uh, we were just kind of talking about that, but for winter fishing, how shallow water were you fishing the back of the creek?" Uh, now, in the back of the creeks, you know, the back of the creeks is more of a. Did you finish? I'm sorry. I no, I was going to say Peyton doesn't go back in those creeks too no, far. No, he doesn't anymore. go back. No, there. no, Peyton, Peyton doesn't go back there anymore. He's a main leg guy now. <laughs> he used to. He's he's a little skittish now. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can go all the way up into one of those creeks. You know, you can get way up in them, but you got to have a little bit of water depth. You know, you got to have a little dab of water depth up in there. Uh, you know, so you got to have a little bit of a little bluffy stretch way up in them. Uh, but for the most part. You know, you got to be around the food. Uh, in the early, early spring, like right now, clean up till, you know, mid-March, you still got to be around those shad because on those cloudy days, the bulk of that fish's food is still going to be shad-oriented, okay? One of the ways I do it, I go into one of them creeks my first day that I'm on the water on any lake. I start at the mouth of a major creek major creek arm i get out off the bank of you know 100 yards out off the shoreline and i just head to the back of it with my depth finder going as my depth finder's going i'm idling looking for those shed when i first start seeing those shed i'm just going to kind of slow down a little bit you know and, I, and i'm just going to really take my time moving then and i'm going to move up through there real easy and when i start seeing those bowls of shad you know here there and around i'm going to start fishing you know, I'm going to go to the bank, no matter where it's at, I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to start fishing. You got to be around the food. Simple as that. If you go all the way to the ass end of those creeks, you're going to find you're going to go through the shed, through the shed, through the shed, and then nothing. And you're going to get into that where there's not any shed anymore. The main thing is you got to stay around the food because on those cloudy days, their primary food source is still going to be shed of some of some form or fashion now you throw a bright bluebird day out there on them then they're probably going to move up to the bank and get out there on them rocks looking for a crawdad you know that a crawdad's come out a little bit early but they're still going to be around those shed they're not going to be they're not going to be a half a mile away from those shed so i always try to make sure that i keep an eye on my depth finder and i find the shed first before i start looking and fishing the bank or fishing anywhere, I'm going to find some food and make sure there's food there. Uh, on these Ozark lakes, it, it's easy because we have so much food in the lakes, okay? But if there's no food out there at the mouth of it, then I'm going to move up in it till I find the food. Uh, you know, 99% of the time, they're going to be in a major creek arm somewhere. Uh, and when I say that, I just take off. I spend a few minutes idle until I find some food. Once I find the shed, then I'm going to take the time to start fishing and figure out how to catch it. But, you know, you got to be around, you got to be around what he eats 90% of the time. You know, now those great big days. 
Huh? Sometimes we overthink things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You want to know what banks fish on Lake of the Ozarks? Put your trolling motor down and fish for an hour. That's the way I practice a lot of times. Right. When I go out there, if I don't know where the shad's at or anything else, I'll put my trolling motor down and I'll look at my watch. That's how dumb I am. I have to make myself fish for an hour. Okay. That's hard to do. Think about that. Fish with your trolling motor down, headed in the same direction up in a creek for one hour. That's hard. Yeah. Okay. But in that one hour, you're going to fish a bluffy type bank. You're going to fish chunk rock. You're going to fish pea gravel. You're going to fish a pocket. You're going to fish a point. In that hour's time on Lake of the Ozarks, I don't care where you stop. You're going to fish all the variety of banks that we have to offer in one hour's time. At some point in that hour, you're going to go across the right strip of bank that they're, that they're on whether it be rocks that are this big around or, you know, or bluffs or, or pea gravel or sand, uh, you're going to fish over the right stretch of bank. And guess what? If I don't know what they're doing and I can't find any shed, that's what I do. I start along the side of one of them big major creeks and I just keep my trolling motor down for about an hour. 99% of the time before it gets to be, in the late, to, well, basically when they start thinking about spawning, a boat dock is nothing but in your way. It's just something that you got to fish around. Does it hold a bass better than the bank that it's sitting on? No. The bank that it's sitting on is what's holding the bank or holding the fish. The dock is just something you got to throw around. Okay. He's not standing on that dock because it's sitting where it's sitting. He is sitting there on that bank because it's a little shelf rock bank, it's chunk rock, or it's a bluff bank, or it's pea gravel. That's why he's there, okay? Once you figure out what kind of banks they get on, then you just go from there. You know, then you just take off and you start fishing that, that style of banks, that kind of rocks, uh, little tiny pockets, you know, little points. But in that hour's time, guess what? You're going to figure out where they're at. You know, you just fish where you got the most bites. And in that same creek where you're at, every time you pull to that style of bank, I guarantee you, you're going to find that that's where they're at. They're, they're on that particular kind of shoreline, you know. Bank changes are like a road, they're like a stop sign to a bass. When you go from rocks that are this big to rocks that are this big, that, that's like a stop sign. That's just, that's like a point you know, to those bass. Now, it's mild, and it's it's not something that just jumps out at you all the time, but a good bank change means everything to a bass, you know, and that's on any Ozark lake, you know, and it's on most lakes around the country. You go from a clay point to something that's got rocks mixed in, right there where it transitions, that's where they're at 99% of the time, you know, uh, and, and our lakes up here, we don't have grass, we don't have grass in them, so therefore, like I say, a good bank change, you might as well throw a tree out there. I mean, that's something that that bass recognizes. And a lot of times, they don't need an excuse to stop swimming. That's all it is. It's an excuse for them to just eh, put on the brakes. And like I say, you got to pay attention to those little things like that, and, and uh, it'll catch you more fish. I mean, simple as that. And then you can just duplicate that. You yeah, can... just duplicate it right there where you're at. The nice thing about Lake of the Ozarks, it's big enough that you can't do that everywhere. But in that creek where you're at, oh, yeah, you can do, do the exact same thing in that creek where you're at. And you can catch fish on those type of banks, those style of banks. Now, if you haul off and you leave uh, Buck Creek and you run up above the new bridge to the glaze, you might have to relocate it. You might have to redo that because you have just left change the whole area of the lake. You know, odds are they're going to be real close to the same no matter where you go on the lake. But the only thing with Lake of the Ozarks is every twist and turn changes the water temperature just a little bit. Okay? Every twist in the lake, every turn in the lake means that that water temperature is probably slightly different here and there and around. And it's just because maybe the way the wind blew in there and blew some of that cool water in there or, or you know, blew some of that 
you know, water out of a creek and warmed it up a little bit, stuff like that, you know. Uh, but every time the lake makes a turn, it's slightly going to change a little bit the way the fishing is. But once you figure them out in a certain area, hell, that's easy. You know, then you just run around and fish the same size rock that you just caught that one off of, you know. I've just made that pretty easy for everybody to go find them on Lake of the Ozone. I know. You did. That's, that's, that's the way I do tip, it. Man. That's the way I do it. So that's a great tip. Uh, Bass Guy 1960 says, Dion, do you prefer living rubber or silicone skirts on your jigs? You know, I probably prefer silicone the bulk of the time. Uh, I throw a lot of that old rubber, uh, you know, in different things. You know, I, I'm no different than anybody else. I've got a little solid brown jig that I really like fishing. 90% uh, of mine got a little bit of silicone mixed in with it uh, just because I like to make good camouflage uh and when i say camouflage everything that swims in the lake has a natural camouflage okay natural camouflage is dark on the back light on the belly everything i mean from a great white shark to a minnow dark on the back light on the belly so therefore all of my jigs are going to mimic that a live crawdad live crawdad down his back he's dark green and he's dark colored flip him over he's kind of an old muddy light cream colored almost you know almost white how many crawds that dads do you ever throw on the lake that's got a white belly or a pearl colored belly and you turn over every crawdad you see and you look at what color his belly is 90 mm percent -hmm. of them are real creamy white looking okay i'm not going to tell you that i don't have a guido bug that's made that color because i do uh, and I do in multiple colors too, you know, uh, even dark colors, dark colors, light colors, you know, I've, I've got them and I just think about that stuff. You know, you can do the same thing. You can start out with a green pumpkin guido bug and you make it natural camouflage. Take your chartreuse marker and go down the belly of it and really color up the belly of it. Okay. Well, that bright chartreuse is going to wear off pretty quick. Okay. But it's still going to make dark on the back, light on the belly. Okay. Everything I throw in the water has got that, you know, everything. Very seldom do I throw any bait. I don't throw a zoom fluke out there. I don't throw a, you know, any kind of a bait out there that doesn't have some sort of natural camouflage to it. You know, um, when I'm throwing a worm, you know, throwing a worm on my shaky head, almost always it's going to have a different color belly on it, you know, and I might do that, like I say, with a, with a marker, you know, just color up the belly of it with a marker. Or I might take a green pumpkin and go down the back of it with a, with a, you know, June bug or blue marker, you know, something just to give it a black back, you know, uh, you know, bluegills as they swim around, they got a little chartreuse tail that kicks around behind them. And you'll notice that when you're standing on the boat dock waiting for your partner to come in and pick you up and you see a bluegill swim by you, you will notice that little chartreuse tail doing that, just barely paddling along behind that little green pumpkin colored bluegill, okay? A baby bass. Baby bass is white, green, and he's got a black tail. Guess what? What's the last thing a bass sees when he eats a baby bass? That little black tail, giving it that, kicking away from him, you know? Take the time, make your stuff look good, you know? When a crawdad is doing this and got his hands up in the air, you know, that's that, God was very cruel to crawfish. He only gave him a couple of defenses, and none of them work <laughs> on a bass. None of them, okay? But one of them is to either dart away or he throws those claws up in the air, and that's all he's got, okay? Well, when a bass swoops down there to get that, what's the last thing he sees? Is those claws right there in his face. Why not take the extra minute or a few seconds to take your green pumpkin crawl and put just a little bit of, little bit of orange right there on the tips? Because there's no crawdad you can find or any of your viewers can find that the very tip of that crawdad, his pinchers, is an obscenely different color than the rest of his body. Okay? At, at no stage of the molt is a crawdad's pinchers the same color as the rest of his body. Now, I'm just talking the very eighth of an, 16th to an eighth of an inch on the tips of them. They're always a brighter color, almost always. Take out an extra second, you know, 
uh, buy you a couple of them, ga you know, garlic markers and carry them in your boat, you know, chartreuse, orange, red, you know, uh, I carry green pumpkin ones in my boat, uh, stuff like that. Give your baits that natural camouflage that they really need to have, you know, um, you know, on any given day, as long as you're throwing green pumpkin or black and blue, it's all good enough. But on those days when it's a little bit tougher, he might be swimming down there to your bait, looking at it and going, eh, uh -uh, you know, and swimming away, you know, oh, wait a minute. That one don't have no color on the end of his pinchers. He's not, he doesn't look like the other thousand I've eaten in my lifetime. You know, I think I'll yeah. turn away from him. I just, my dad was always the one, always make it good enough to fool that fish. Always. Any bait you throw in the lake, make it look good to him. You know, why throw something ugly out there? Uh, you know, now, like I say, when they're biting, you could drag a pine cone out there and they'd still eat it most of the time, you know. But guess what? I'm not teaching you all anything about catching the fish on those days because you already know how to catch them. Right, you throwed your piece of pork out there and caught him on that day. Yeah. <laughs> For Christ's sakes, I well, had to slam you one more time on it. <laughs> just rub yeah. it in. Well, but you it, actually, somebody actually believes that that makes a difference. It, it doesn't to me. A piece of pork looks good as it's flowing along. Okay, when it's sitting on the bottom, looks like a piece of pork. You know, looks right. like it ought to be in a skillet or something. You know. Well, <laughs> what you just said though is, if you get in the habit of making that marking your crawl dead up and making it look good every time you don't have to wait for that time when you really need to you're it's you're fishing it that way all the time you know it's like i figured i figure if you're not fishing for a big one every cast that your bait's in there guess what you're never going to get him you know always make it to where it's perfect where it will mm -hmm. fool the most weary of bass out there and the most weary one He's the one that's been jerked at, snatched at by every Tom, Dick, and Harry that went down the bank in front of you, okay? Take an extra second. Make your stuff look right. You know, Zoom Fluke, why would you throw a blind shad out there? A shad with no eyes. That's, that's completely stupid. I mean, he's got to see where he's going. <laughs> Guess what? A little black Sharpie can put a pair of little black eyes right there on the front of that dude and a shad dot. No shad he eats does not have eyeballs and a shad dot. Yeah. None of them. That's true. Okay? So if he has to swim up there to it and give it a split second, whether he's going to eat it or not eat it, he's going to eat mine. He's not going to – it's not going to – he's not going to think twice about going ahead and gobbling mine up. But if you just throw a regular old fluke out there with no eyeballs and no shad dot on it, then, you know, they better be biting. I thought he had a new color of, of fluke when he said blind Chad. I'm like, I haven't seen that one in the catalog. I got to yeah. try that one out. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and the thing of it is I, I'm pretty basic on my colors too. You know, I, I don't, I don't have a ton of different colors I carry with me. I just make sure they all look right. You know, when I go to table rock, I take that same ledge, ledge rock lures crawdad and I put little, little orange dots up on that crawl's body. And I put them at every joint. Every joint in a crawfish's, you know, where his shell connects and stuff. Every dot, every, every joint on that crawdad will have an orange dot on one side and an orange dot on the other side. Every one of them. That's so when they get put together, they know how to work. That's a, yeah, out. it's it's yeah, it's like the Lincoln log type deal. It's like numbers, you know. <laughs> every one of them has that little tiny orange dot on both sides. At every joint in his claws, where his claws split and everything, right there where those claws go in and out like that, there'll be two orange dots right there. Okay. Well, unless you throw just orange flake in your bait, which doesn't look the same, trust me. I can make one take a hold of my bait when he won't anything else. And, mm. and it's just take it a few minutes. You can take that same little orange marker and go around and poke them little dots on there, just lickety split on what he can see. What's what's hanging out from below your skirt, you know, out from under the skirt on your jig. Just make it look right. You know, take an extra minute, make it look right. Trust me, you can go overboard, which I do sometimes, but when it goes in the lake, I have all the confidence in the world that no matter what bass swims up to it, he will take a hold of it when he sees it. 
guess what? That's good stuff. It That's only really has to be stuff. good in my mind. It doesn't have to be good in your mind. I don't have to convince you because I don't care if you catch one or not. <laughs> right. I have to have the confidence that I'm going to catch it. And and that's all that matters to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to take out some stock and spike it markers or the market marker company because I'm I about need, to bunch buy a bunch well, of well I this. need to take it to the next level. I mean I, I'm I just I, buy the I, tips. I, yeah, I do that quite a bit, but I'm gonna mark it up. I'm gonna make yeah. it pretty. I go to Walmart, there. I go to Walmart also, not to knock spike it because I I use spike it 90% of the time I use spike it, but I go to Walmart and I buy the Sharpies like you get with a free pair of tennis shoes at the first of school year, you know? Yeah. I, I get like the ones that's got 44 colors on. Right. And I carry that in my boat with me because they got some real pretty blues and greens in there that sure do make a fluke look, look nice. I'm just going to tell you right now. <laughs> and, you're, an, you're an artiste. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's three Hibdens that fish for a living. We all got the same little batch of colors on our boats. Trust me. And <laughs> sounds and like we need to take a trip down there and jump in the like, boat just like to a, see what's what the stock looks like. That's like a that's, stock duffer. That's from Guido Hibden right there. You know. <laughs> Here's a really cool question right here from Hill Brothers. He says, "What was the first real quality rod and reel that started you on your journey into this crazy sport of bass fishing?" Well, the the. The fishing, well, my first rod, my first fishing rod was a browning. I had a five and a half foot browning that uh, pistol grip that I started with, with a 5,000 C uh, Garcia. And uh, and when I first started fishing with it, I only had one because I was a little kid, you know, I only had one. And dad didn't want us tearing up more line than that, so he said now you screw that up learn how to fix it you know and uh but that's the one i started with years and years and years ago and uh there was times where i thought man they'll never make anything any better than this that's the greatest rod and reel that's ever been built you know uh you know and then i then i got sponsored a little bit berkeley trialene was actually the first people that ever gave me anything uh, as far as equipment uh and that's because i guided one of the guys that invented stuff for berkeley he would come to lake of the ozarks and dad would take all the higher ups fishing and and there i stood on the bank you know 10 11 years old and he said hey take me fishing you know and i would take him fishing so the neat thing about it was i got all the new cool stuff something new would come out that they were going to put out on the market he'd send me a couple of them and uh and it was kind of the same way when the lightning rods came out remember the ones with the lightning bolts on them they called it oh, they yeah. were called lightning rods uh and they came out with a straight handled one you know and it was only like six foot six and a half foot you know and i thought that was pretty innovative that was a pretty cool rod it wasn't a pistol grip uh and i thought that was pretty dang special you know uh and then through the same guiding uh I went to Quantum, uh, old boy from Quantum Motor Guide, uh, hired me when I first started fishing the tournaments. Uh, and way, way back then, trust me, it wasn't like when Van Dam came along. It was back when they would send me about 30 rods of one style, and I would send most of, most of them back in two pieces within a couple of weeks. Uh, they, they just made junk, you know, <laughs> but but I used it because it was a sponsor, and I wanted to I wanted to make it work. and and uh, Finally, dad, you know, told me, he says, hey, he says, you're losing too many fish because of that stuff. And he got me on with Daiwa. And when he got with me, got me in on the Daiwa deal, uh, you know, then it was the Light and Tough series. The Light and Tough series probably changed my life as far as, you know, what I thought was just the perfect little piece of equipment, you know, uh, we took a seven six one, and we cut the handle down on it to where we felt comfortable with it, and that is now what all of our seven three rods that we have designed for every rod company I've been with since came from a seven six light and tough flipping stick. Everything that's mimicked from then till this day came from that. 
Uh, so that's probably the rod that probably has stuck with me the longest, you know. Uh, and when I say that, it was from Daiwa, American Rod Smith, Castaway, uh, you know, now to lose. Uh, you know, every one of them makes that same 7.3, you know, medium heavy jig rod that I skip with and have used my whole career, basically, you know. So, so probably that 7.3 is probably the one. Um, but, but anyways, and that's still, it's still my favorite rod to the day, you know, till right now. Uh, you know, some of the newer stuff that they have, you know, I, I, you know, they change a lot of things. The only problem with having a big pro staff, you listen to everybody and then you got 20 different rods out there. And when you get 20 rods out there, you confuse people. You know, you really, you confuse people on what's, you know, what's what, you know, uh, in the loose stuff, I still use those silver rods with the, you know, the, the new kind of funky handle on them, like the wind grip handles. Uh, yeah. The custom, custom lights. Yeah. It's still the silver rod though. You know, than any of the newer rods, I use a couple of them, you know, for, for other applications, but all my jig rods are still those custom light silver with the silver wind grip handles, you know? Uh, and I just think it's perfect. You know, every year when I get my rod order, I order about 10 more of those, you know, because I keep thinking, yeah, they're probably going to change them one of these days and I ain't going to be able to get them no more. Yep. You know? uh, and if somebody can skip better than me, by golly, bring them on. I'd like to see it, you know. I would love to take their money if they want to come have a contest, you know, uh, <laughs> because I, I've never, I, it's perfect. I mean, it really is. Yeah. You know, our, our 7.3, you know, hammer rod is, it's, it's perfect, you know. So, I got three of them. I like I, them. It's, I'm telling you, I can make you a believer. All you got to do is go fishing. I can make you a believer that it is the best skipping rod you've ever seen. I'm going to have to try that one out. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good one. I mean, it's they're a good one. They're, they're one of the best frog rods, in my opinion, is that, that 7.6 that they got in that same yeah. lineup. That's a good frog rod. They really got a good, good they rod. they got just enough tip on all of those rods yep. that it makes you a better caster. It just mm -hmm. makes you such a better caster. Just because that little bit of tip on the end of it, you know, it just makes a big difference when you're mm -hmm. when you're trying to make accurate cast and you know, and you're you're trying to get under stuff and stuff like that, you know. Uh you know, I I use a lot of long rods too, you know. I still I still flip with a lot of eight foot rods and stuff like that. But anytime I'm gonna cast. That seven three is kind of the deal, you know. I know I can sling it up under there and and make it go places that you know no man's gone before. Uh, <laughs> and and and, it's, and a lot of that comes from the style and and what we do and everything. But I know if you use too stiff a rod doing it, you can't cast as well, you know. So, and like I say, I know this because I have to fish behind the other two fishermen that I think are better than I am at skipping. You know, and I have to be in the boat with them every now and then. <laughs> and uh, every now and then they'll come up with a new stick. You know, Lawson's terrible. Lawson's going to buy something that he thinks he can do better with. Anywhere he sees it, he's going to own it, buy it, try it. And then we'll have a skipping tournament and I'll convert him back to, you know, getting out them silver rods and, you know, and he finishes a tournament with that. Uh, because it's just the best rod for that. You know, you need to skip accurately around stuff to get your bait back under stuff. I've, like I say, I've tried all that I've seen, and that's still the best one. Hmm. I need to get down there more to practice. We have one lake around here that has docks, and it's Lake of Egypt, but you cannot fish within 10 feet of the docks. So it does you absolutely no good. You can stare at it, you can salivate, but you can't cast at them. So it's, I just, we just don't get a lot of jig skipping practice. I mean, you know, lay downs, maybe you can skip and slide it up underneath the lay down and stuff, but uh, I don't know. I've heard, I've heard rumors that they are, they're trying to do that on Lake the Ozarks. Really? You I, That eliminates I've heard, like I've heard rumors of that and I got asked about it and I'm like, do you realize how much water that would eliminate Especially if you put a little cushion around it, like a like you said right there, you know, so many feet. Well, that would eliminate three quarters of the lake. Yeah. You know, 
everybody would go fishing in the glaze from then in, I get then on, I guess, you know, or you'd fish bluffs, one of the two. But yeah, it, it yeah, I've heard rumors of it. And they asked me, they said, would you be willing to speak about it? I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I would. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, because the thing of it is, you don't have that many dock owners here that complain. You don't. I mean, yes, you hear about one. If you have a tournament that has 200 boats in it, you'll hear one bad story for the week. You know, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. one. But, you know, for the most part, if you're nice to those people, I throw in there, I get hung up while they're swimming on them sometimes. And, you know, you just got to talk to them and, you know, and, and they won't, you know, you just got, Hey, you know, I, I'm sorry, made a bad cast, you know, wind caught it wrong, you know, and right. slung it up on there, you know, but would you rather me come in there and get it or leave it hung on there for your grandkid to get his foot hung on? Exactly. So exactly. it'd probably be better for me to just come in there and get it. That way nobody gets hooked, you know, and for the most part, if you explain that to them, everything's good after that you know you can fish around that boat dock rest of your life and nobody will care so but you it's got you got to be honest, you know you know you can't just be all abrasive about it anytime you make a mistake like that you know uh you know trust me i have talked my way out of dinging a mini a pontoon boat in my lifetime and, <laughs> and uh, you know you just gotta explain hey it's only my second time fishing you know <laughs> Got our bail rat boat. It's just second time fishing. That's right. I just I just started yesterday. Bought this <laughs> on the way to the lake today. <laughs> Some guy named Dion. He just sold yeah. it to me. <laughs> Never heard of that damn guy. I got a pretty I got a pretty good story on that. Me and Dad were crappie fishing, and we were shooting under boat docks, and uh, we're fit, just me and him's in the boat. He's sitting back there on the back, and I'm kind of positioned the boat where he can get in those good dark holes and. And I'm skipping, finding them and stuff going down through the bank. And, and uh, needless to say, I look up down the shoreline about five or six docks. And this deck up on this boat, or up on this house, is standing full of people, you know. A couple little kids and, you know, just a whole handful of people. And finally, I see this about a 10-year-old kid, you know, he's looking at us, you know. And, and he's realizing, you know. And we was back then, I was in a Chevy wrap boat and. And, you know, and I can hear him talking, you know, you can hear out on the water real good. And he says, that's them. I know it is, you know, I know I'm going to find something to get an autograph. And dad says, you got anything in there we can sign? And I said, yeah, I probably got a hat or an extra hat in here. And I got out and got that hat out and, and uh, laid it out on the front deck. And, and we keep fishing on him down through there. And, and we get to his dock and that kid comes off that porch. I mean, around hundred mile an hour, gets down there. And his dad's like, slow down, slow down, they're fishing, you know. And he slows down right at the walkway of the dock, and he stops. And I go to shoot my little jig back down alongside of their big old boat. And when it hits, it hits, skips up, catches the rope, and it just goes around the rope about 27 times, you know, just like one will. <laughs> he turns around. I don't do nothing. He turns around, looks up at the deal, and says, that ain't them. And turns around and walks away. <laughs> he walks back up to the oh, porch. Oh. His dad had to make him come back down and get our autograph. Oh, but as soon as I made that bum cast and it wrapped around the rope, he says, that ain't them. And it just, oh. he just took off. I thought, well, there you go. Yeah. Dad says, well, you screwed that up. Oh, Lord. Uh, he, was, he was hard on you, man. Oh, yeah. Critical. But We got any more questions? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, we got a couple more here. Uh, Chuck's got one. He said, uh, one fall a lot of years ago, you and your dad just smashed them in a multi-day tournament on Lake of the Ozarks with a big jig out 30, foot, out 30 feet plus on bluffs and ledges. How often does that pattern occur and what conditions? You, you know, when that happened, that was in an FLW tournament. First time they brought one of the tour-level events here. Uh, Dirk Slater actually started catching them out there uh before the cutoff we fished a two-day tournament a two-day bfl which in that time of year i normally win in september right before it went off limits for the cutoff the end of september and me and dad both made the top five catching 14 pounds a day well dirt comes in and he finishes wins the tournament wins the deal on the last day 
and his partner won the amateur division that day. And he gets up there on stage and he goes to bragging about how they caught 50 keepers that day. Well, needless to say, when Dirk got off stage, he walks straight over there to Dad's boat and he goes to talk to us. What do you guys do? You know, Dad says, I don't even want to talk to you. He said, Why would you let that guy get up there and lie like that? Catching, you know, 40, 50 keepers. And and by that time, that guy had come over there to find Dirk again. And so they're standing there, and Dirk says, uh, he said he he probably wasn't lying, Guido. And, and Dad says, what do you mean? And Dad looks at me, and he says, how many did you catch today? And I told him, I said, I caught seven. I said, how many did you catch? And he said, I caught six. And Dad looks at Dirk, and he says, tell me the truth. How many did you catch? And Dirk says, I don't really know. He says, probably 50 or more. And Dad's like, you lying little, you know, so-and-so. He says, get away from my boat. And Dirk says, I'm not lying, Guido. He says, we whacked them. And he says, oh, I see that. He said, but you didn't catch that many. He says, hell, we're two of the best fishermen here on the pond. And he said, we didn't catch them like that. And uh, Dirk told me, he says, you're just not doing quite the right thing. And I said, well, I got one more day before this thing goes off limits, before that big tournament. I said, we're going in the morning. And uh, so before, it, you know, Port went on its two day, two weeks off limits i met him down there at the launch ramp the next morning he goes to idle out of here and right out in front of takeoff out in front of pb2 there's a high spot straight out in the middle of the lake out there as we're idling out to it he's just he's just still idling you know and i said what are we gonna do fish the biggest community hole on the lake he says yep we sure are and he goes to pull up on this thing when the depth finder hit about 45 feet, there's a rock. And it's, you know, very pronounced. You can see it on the depth finder, a rock. And it had two arcs standing on top of it. Two fish arcs standing right on top of that rock. He just shuts the boat off. Stands up, pulls a big one-ounce jig back to him, throws that behind the boat. And I said, them ain't bass. He said, just wait. Let's it down in there. Needless to say, first thing you know, you can see he's pulling it up on top of that rock. Pulls it up on top of that rock, and his line jumps, and he catches a six-pounder. Huh. We turn around. We idle back over the rock while he's taking his six-pounder off, and there's only one arc standing on top of that rock. And I'm like, holy crap. I said, the top of that rock's 40 foot deep. I said, the bottom of the rock's 45. He says, yep. He says, every one of them's in the 30-plus range. He said, you're just fishing where they ain't. He said, the bulk of the fish are out there deeper. So I was sitting down in the driver's seat, and I just turned around with the island back into PB2. He says, what are we doing? He said, you forget something in the truck? I said, nope. I said, we are good buddies. And he's like, yes, we are, by God. I said, I'm taking your ass back to the truck right now. He's like, I took all day off work today. And uh, I said, dude, I said, I don't know any of your spots. And I said, if that's your best spot right out there, I said, yep, I'm going to take that one from you. And he says, no, that's just a community hole. I said, my point exactly. I said, we are exceptionally good friends. I said, I am taking you to the house. I said, you showed me all I need to see if that's the case. And he gave me the two jigs that he had tied on his rods. And I went and immediately called my dad. And at that time, my dad lived in Buck Creek. And I told my mom, I said, get his ass out of bed. I said, I'm coming to get him. And my dad had told me the day before because we'd been fishing so hard for that two-day BFL. He says, I ain't going tomorrow. He said, I need to rest. And I called mom at 7.15, and I told her, I said, you get him out of bed. I said, he's got to see this. And uh, needless to say, he, she tells me, she says, he said he'll see you down here below the house at 9 o'clock. And I said, okay. So from 7.15 or so till 9 o'clock, I had about 27, 28 pounds in the live well when I went and picked him up from the dock. Dang. And I went and picked him up, and he got the boat. And, and I didn't say a word to him. First thing you know, you know, when you get that many in the same live well, they give one of the big whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. He said, what the hell? You got a big catfish in there? I said, yeah, look at that big catfish in there. He opens the live well up, and he says, Holy crap, they were all five and six pounders. I said, yes, they are. 
And I said, that's why I called you to come see this happen. He's like, did you guys do this? I said, no, Dirk only caught one of them, and we turned it back. And uh, he said, what would you do? And I told him about taking him back to the house. But we just started fishing everything we would normally fish, but we just started when the boat hit about 45 foot, we would start fishing up to those points, high spots, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, in that particular year, there had been no rain since May. I mean, it was the driest summer. And here it is, you know, the end of September, uh, you know, when we, when we started figuring them out. And uh, through the day, we figured it out that the quicker it got to the bottom, the better off you were. And all we had was those two big one ounces that, that Dirk could give me. So Dad gets down, and he gets in my Carolina rig box, and he gets a, out a one-ounce slip sinker, puts it on his line, then ties his jig back on, and starts throwing that. We called it the big pecker because it looked like a chicken beak. Sticking off the front of it. You guys thought I was going to get you in trouble, there, didn't you? But it looked like it had a beak with that big one ounce sinker would stick out away from the jig. And we just slayed them on. I mean, quicker you got it to the bottom, I mean, the better they bite it. But those fish, the thermocline was about 20 foot deeper than it had ever been. And it's never been that deep before or since. Uh, you know, it's, it's always, now we have enough current flow through the lake that the lake never, the thermocline never gets that deep. You know, that was, that was back in like 06 or 07, something like that. I think it was. Uh, but yeah, we came home. Dad came home. We had 14 days before the tournament and dad made us a football jig that weighed a little over two ounces. And that's what I, that's what I won the tournament on. Two ounces. Yeah. Holy cow. That's a big, that's a big jig. <laughs> that's that. <laughs> it's big. It's big. My, yeah. uh, my first day partner was Bud Strader. Wesley Strader's dad was my first day partner. Uh, and I told him, he drawn me and he says, man, are we going to fleece him tomorrow? I said, yes, we are. I said, I am for sure. I said, I don't know about you, but I said, I am. I said, go back to your Tennessee boys. And I said, get the biggest jig you can find. I said, just ask them all. You want the biggest one they can find. And I said, bring those. And I said, you still won't be close. And uh, he says, okay. You know, he shows up next day and he's got a handful of three quarters and a couple of one ounces. And uh, I pull up on the side of a little point. And the thing of it was, you didn't have to be out on the points. They, they were along the sides. They were along bluffy places. You know, we caught them in a lot of places that we would never normally fish. Uh, and as the tournament wore on, that's where I tried to focus on, you know, so I wouldn't have to pull up on a point and have somebody else out there with me. Uh, but the first little side of a point that I pulled up on, same deal as I'm idling up on it, I come out of 50 up to about 40, and there's two fish standing on one rock. And uh, I just shut the boat off and let that thing out beside the boat and, and uh, caught a 713 on my first drop. And uh, <laughs> don't even have a trolling motor down and he says man are they all going to be that big i said i kind of doubt it but i said i sure hope some of them are <laughs> and uh but ended up catching 24 or something that day and was in second place dave lefebvre had caught 25 that day in october and uh but anyways and ended up catching you know 79 something in the you know in the three days but but it was pretty crazy. That was just paying attention. I so well, you said it's never been that thermocline's never been that deep. That's never been never been right again. Huh. I do fish close to the thermocline now a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do get my bait on down there. You know, if thermocline gets down there in the 20s and deeper, you know, I fish I fish that deep a lot because I know they're not afraid to get down there. You know, if the food's down there. Every one that I caught, I caught them all on a big green pumpkin jig. Well, I caught them on a jig that's same color as in Uh, you know, basically is the jig color. Uh, all of them had a big flappy tail on it. The tail had to swim um, on the back of that big two ouncer because it was it was sickling to the bottom. I mean, you know, two ounces, it's going down. I mean, that's when great. it hit when it hit the bottom, uh, you know, on a flipping stick, it felt like 
you know, it felt like he got a bite. Yeah. But it probably threw a dust cloud up, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No doubt in my mind. But uh, needless to say, when when it got to the bottom, you know, you would, you know, within two or three pulls most of the time, you would have him bite it. Uh, But catching them all on that big green pumpkin jig like that, and every one of them that I pulled in had a gizzard shad tail, tail sticking out of its mouth that was, you know, as wide as, as wide as their mouths. I mean, they were eating those giant gizzard shad way down there. And that's back before any of us knew much about any kind of swim baits that would have been effective down there. You know? Yeah, right. We were, we were actually catching them where they were living, not where they were feeding, because they were feeding on them big shad. We were catching them where they were standing, hanging out, you know. And that's 80% of the time. You know, they only spend about 20% of the time feeding in a day. Rest of the time, they spend it hanging out. And luckily enough, we found where they were standing the bulk of the time, waiting to go feed. And uh, and like I say, that was the whole key to it. Get them down there where they're living, bouncing around on them rocks right there by where they were standing and hiding around. And, and you can make one come and get your bait. Because they weren't used to seeing baits down there. No. Simple as that. Zero pressure down straight, there. You could have thrown straight black and caught them just as good, you know, because it's so dark down there. They're not seeing the colors, you know. But, but needless to say, it was the bait was the key. Just getting it down there to them, getting something down there that they could hear and find. And you know, you take that much lead down on the bottom, shoot, they can hear that. That's making noise down there in them rocks. <laughs> you don't need pork to do you? We would make two little, two or three little hops when we'd pull it up and you'd feel it up against a rock. We just sit there and make little old six inch hops off the bottom. And all you're doing is making it go, tum, 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 you know, and you're actually drawing them to it, you know, but, but That's it was great. It was fun. It was crazy. We had, we caught a lot of big bass. Dad, we, I won that one uh, the first of October and dad won the central Missouri pro am in December doing the exact same thing. Wow. They bit they bit it that away all fall long. And when I say he won the deal, well, the very next weekend was our big two-day Lake of the Ozark tournament. Kenyon Hill and Lawson won it the very next weekend. Uh, you know, Kenyon came, from, Kenyon came from Oklahoma just so he could fish with Lawson. And uh, Lawson was 10. And the uh, first day they had five that weighed 26 before I shut my boat off. Before I got to my first spot, wow. they had 26. Called me and they said, hey, you passed us about five minutes ago. Where are you at? And I said, I'm almost to my spot. Shut up. Leave me alone. And uh, they said, well, if you want to, you can turn around and come back. They're really biting where we're at. And I said, where I seen you? And uh, they said, yeah. And I said, why? What do you got? And he says, Ken- and Kenyon got on the phone. He says, I don't know. He said, we might not have 28, but he said, we got 26 or 27. I'm like, holy crap. Well, needless to say, when I stopped, there was a flotilla of boats that followed my butt around, you know. And my Lawson's twin brother, Connor, he says, do you know all these people? And I'm like, no. I said, they just think they know me and they want to watch. And uh, (laughs) we struggled around. We caught 18, 19 pounds a day. But Kenyon and Lawson had another stringer the next day that weighed 25-something, you know. Wow. And then, then, like I say, on up in December – when everybody else was catching 18, 19 pounds a day, what dad was catching in the mid twenties, you know, both days in the central Missouri pro am. See, William's on to you. He, Dion's not going to tell you, but he was probably actually using pork trailer back then to catch those. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I think, the pork, I think the pork couldn't have stood the pressure. I think, I think pork would have evaporated before it got to the bottom or something. <laughs> it would have burned, it would, well, it would have left a hell of a trail though. Yeah, it might That's have. trail. See, that's a good uh, thing about your your crew that's watching this thing. Cool viewers. I mean, that was good. I needed that right there. You know, <laughs> I needed a little knockback on the pork deal. Yeah, you were one up on me, so he just, just he, he poked you back. I'm just glad Denny Brower moved to Texas and he's not hearing this. You know, because oh, that boy was big time pork user. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That was his deal. You know, but I used to believe in it, but I sure don't any. I I just you know. It's one. Of them. Let's not get started on that. <laughs> let's pick. Let's pick one more question here, and uh, 
we've been on here for about two and a half hours. It just flies by when you're having fun. So we'll we'll uh pick one more question here. And um well, this might be interesting. Brock says his very first boater in FLW was Randall Hudson. He said he had incredible stories about Guido and Dion. Does that name ring a bell? Absolutely. Yeah, Randall still fishes quite a bit around here, you know, in this part of the country. Still fishes BFLs and stuff. Yeah, Randall traveled with us there for for a little bit, uh, you know, right right off the get-go. He was with Lucky Strike also because he lived right down there by where Lucky Strike was built in Cassville, Missouri. Uh, you know, whale of a fisherman on Table Rock and those lakes down there, uh, you know. He won one on the Connecticut River uh, in Connecticut. He won, won one of them. It seemed like it was a big $200,000 deal or something. It was a big tournament. But, uh, oh, yeah, Randall's still around. Still a hell of a fisherman. Uh, I don't think he does it quite as hard as he used to. I think he just picks a circuit. and uh, Like one year, I think he fished the OMTTs. And then the next year, he fished like the BFLs. Uh, you know, I think he still farms. He's a farmer, you know, as far as I know. Uh, but anyways, yeah, I know Randall. Randall a lot. I mean, he's a good guy. I, I mean, I don't talk to him much anymore, but I I see him around tournaments still every now and then, you know. Yeah. So, but, yep, I know Randall Hudson very well. He, he was not telling you a story. He actually traveled with us for a while. Yeah. We actually pulled into a uh, – we pulled into a truck stop somewhere just in the upper part of Missouri. And uh, we went in and ate breakfast, came back out, and his boat was gone. Somebody had unhooked his boat and stole his boat right off the back of his truck. And uh, oh, back why, then, why back you eating then, breakfast? Huh? Why you were eating breakfast? Yes, yes, absolutely. God. Uh, back then, there was something in Kansas where you didn't have to register like your your boat trailer or something like that. And uh and he didn't have, he was one of them ones, didn't ever put a license plate on his on his boat trailer. All the rest of ours has license plates on them, and that's the only thing we can figure. But uh, they must have unhooked that dude, hit I-70, and off to Kansas they went. But uh, <laughs> wow. and I, I can't even remember when he got Ooh. it back. But, oh, yeah, they stole his boat right there while we was eating. And uh, Man, that's ballsy. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. That'd be, yeah. that'd be so, something to walk out to, though. Oh, yeah. You're all full. You're ready to go you're yeah. back on the road. And... Yeah, you're all carved up. Ready well, for a shit. Long yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. But, yeah, I know Randall. I know Randall. Well, you, you, if you got another good question, you ought to ask me. For those people who's been sitting around this damn long, we need to give them something good. Well, we still got like 280 people on here. Or 180, 180 people. Um, Do you normally get that many? No. Well, it's, now I feel big, big draw. it's that pork. It's all that pork trailer talk. Yeah, yeah it's that pork talk. Yeah. Pork Let's versus see, here's plastic. One. Here's one. Um, when fishing tournaments, do you just fish patterns and hope for a big <clears throat> bass bite, or do you have history spots from that pattern that you know will hold the bigger fish? You know, I kind of do. I kind of do both. Uh, you know, I. You know, I have times of the year where I feel like I'm better at it than everybody else, uh, you know, fishing for big ones, uh, you know, which mine is cold. You know, when it's cold, I feel like I can chase a big one better than than the average Joe. Uh, you know, and if I'm here at the home, yeah, if I'm here at home on these lakes, yeah, I, I do feel like I know where some big ones live and where there's always a big one living. Uh, you know, whoever asked the question right there, you got to – you got an area on your favorite lake where you always catch a big one. You know, you two do. You you got a spot where, yep. you know, oh, I always get a big one right here, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I've got those. And and if there's one thing that, you know, doing it as long as I've been doing it, yeah, I got a lot of those around the world, you know. <laughs> there's, there's several of those places where I always feel comfortable catching a big one out of that area uh, or in a specific, you know, specific spot. Uh, but yeah, I, I try to fish what I know where one will be and how one will get. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of times that big ones, they just don't like being jacked with. You know, they don't like being messed with. And and sometimes the really, really inconspicuous, perfect little spots are the key ones, you know. Um, 
He's got to have a food source close and he's got to have a good place to hide. Okay. And if you can find that where every other Tom, Dick and Harry doesn't fish, that's a pretty decent spot for a big bass. Uh, you know, because they don't like being jacked with, they get smart, you know, they get thrown at too much or, you know, get, get bounced around on by too many jigs and they'll move, you know, they'll move to a different spot. Uh, you know, anytime I'm going down the bank or something and, you know, you bump that log with your, with your big motor trimmed down or you hit that stump, you know, I, I, It's like your internet froze up. <laughs> it's going strong for two hours. No, so, no oh, you're back. You you're back. Oh, I can hear yeah. you. When you when you bump that there thing you with your motor with your motor, think about that. That's something that everybody didn't throw at. You know, uh, anytime I bump something like that with my boat that's out off the shore, out off the bank a little ways or something, I mark it on my GPS. You know, I immediately reach over hit a hit a spot on my gps that way next time i come down that bank i can make several good little casts of that piece of cover that you know is out there out off the shore you know and uh you know just something that's maybe not getting thrown at quite as much uh you know and that's that's what i focus on a lot of times you know my dad the last tournament that my dad won on lake eufaula uh bumped a rock with his outboard you know, him and his partner are sitting there fishing and they'd already figured out how to catch the fish. First day of the tournament. They, they, we hadn't figured them out until the first day of the tournament. Uh, throwing a square lip, square lip crankbait on Lake Eufaula. The fish were post-spawn, pre-spawn. They were going, coming in and out of those creeks. But the water had flooded. It had come up real high and got real muddy and, and the water had just kind of pulled back down and, uh, got back down but everything was orange you know the whole lake was just orange and uh they figured out how to catch them on that square lip a little bit on rocky places you know down on the low end of the lake and kind of seawall type stuff you know but they all had foundations out in front of them seawalls dad kind of got that figured out well about noon he bounces over the top of this rock he's he's out off the bank a good cast out off the bank throwing to the bank fishing and his outboard hits this rock. And when he hit it, he's fishing for fish that are on rocks. He just spins the boat around, comes back down current from it, because there's current flowing. And uh, he just sets up, starts fishing the bank again. And he fishes the bank for, you know, probably 20 minutes. And he knows he's right where that rock was at, out in the lake. He just hauls off, make a cast out in front of the boat. He made 11 casts in a row and caught a bass on every cast off of that isolated piece of cover out there hmm. and ends up winning the tournament uh, off of that one isolated rock. His partner catches a 10-4 off hey. of that rock that day. Dad had made the same cast. They both landed out there, and his partner weighed in 26-something that day. Dad had 21. And they both make a cast side by side, and Dad's partner catches this. It's a 10 4, I think is what it was. Well, as soon as he hooks it, it comes up and tries to jump, and Dad's like, Oh my God, look at that one. Dad hooks a fish. Dad jumps down in the floor of the boat, lays his rod down in the floor of the boat, picks up the dip net, dips up that kid's 10 4, throws it in the boat, stands back up, starts winding on his. His comes up and jumps. His is two or three pounds bigger than the one in the net. It's gigantic. Dad said he didn't. Dad said he didn't know if he'd ever seen one that big in the water, the, let alone ever have it on. And it comes up and jumps off. It's been on there the whole time. His partner was landing the other one, and wow. he gets down and lays his rod down to get this guy's fish in the boat. Needless to say, to make a long story short, Dad fishes that rock off and on every day of the tournament. I made the top 10. I caught two that weighed six pounds the first day. I weigh in 28-something the second day and make the top 10 cut. And then there's two days of the top 10 cut. I finish 
seventh in the tournament. Dad beat me by 38 pounds. He won the tournament. I finished seventh, and he beat me by 38 pounds. It was, and, and it was just all amount of, you know, he he found that one rock that nobody else was throwing at, and there was people knew what we were doing. They knew what bait we were throwing by the third and fourth day of the tournament. But needless to say, he had found that one little sweet spot that nobody else was throwing at, had guys fish by him, had guys fish between him and the bank. And the whole time he's thinking, oh, please don't hit that rock. Please don't hit that rock. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, that's that's just those little things that every now and then you get lucky and you have one of those happen. And, and uh, you know, the second day of the tournament, he figured he made 30 casts and bumped the rock every cast before he got a bite. And then the first thing you know, he bumped the rock, got a bite, and uh, caught his limit in five casts. And that day he left it. He caught five that weighed 20, and he got off of it and left it. Wow. But then the next two days, you know, the, the third day, he sat on it and called about 15 times and then, then left it. And the last day he sat on it all day long. And, yeah, it was. So he good. caught all all the fish he weighed in came off of that one rock? In the end, in the end most of them, yeah. Most of them. Now, the, wow. now, he figured by the time it was over with, he could bump the rock with his square lip about the size of a bass boat, you know, about, about that distance. He figured, you know, it was 10, 15 foot, you know, across the top of it, you know, but he said it felt just like an old smooth ass old rock. Just, you know, he said, wow. you just come up there and it'd start hitting it. And as soon as it started hitting it, he said, they'd start trying to take it off of it. Huh. But, that is nuts. But it was a perfect spot. You know, it was, you know, right where you would get post spawners, pre spawners, you know, it's, he would sit and cull until he had a limit of pre-spawners, you know, because they were just naturally heavier. But it's pretty crazy. But you don't find them very often, you know. No. But, and, and they're almost always that away, though. They're where everybody else ain't throwing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just it's a place where nobody else is throwing. Well, they yeah. didn't get big being stupid, so. No. Nope, not at all. Not at all. Well, man. Let's wrap this up. This has been <laughs> well, we got a bunch more questions, but you know, we'll we'll just have to have you on again sometime down the road. And and uh well, I apologize, I can't get to all of them, but I appreciate y'all bunch of people calling in and and uh sending them to you. And like I say, we do this about once a month. We'll surely get most of them done somewhere down the line. <laughs> I know. Hopefully. I know we've had tons of good comments. Everybody saying thanks for coming on here. And great informative show and love the Southern hospitality and, and all the good stuff you'd want to hear. So it's, it's been awesome. Um, only thing you can do for me is think 10 cup. That's, that's the only right. thing I want everybody to do is think 10 cup. Anytime you're in there, you got an option. Think about who, who sponsors bass fishing in the liquor industry. There, there you, you go. go. Next time you're at the store and you're looking for, you know, I almost, for I almost bought my out. bottle over tonight. There you, go. <laughs> you should have said it right should here. Should have said it right here all night. I may have been tempted though. I got to drive home yet. So you brought you brought your fishing bait. I was glad to see that. that <laughs> that's fun for me to see is that old stuff. A lot of times, I mean, anytime you know you're going to be where I'm going to be, I'm going to be at the Bassmasters Classic for a couple of days. Uh, yeah, any of that old stuff you guys got, man, come see me. I'd love to see it. I'm going to be in the 10 cup booth and in the Camus booth some. And, and, uh, like I say, you got any of that old vision tackle? By golly, I'm the guy you want to come see. I like to see it. You know, that's back when stuff really meant something to me. And, and, uh, and I sure like to see people who keep it and collect it, you know. For sure. Good deal. All right. Let's wrap that's it up. It. Let's wrap it up. Appreciate it, uh, Dion. Take care. And Bassmaster Classic, he's going to be there. If you're out in that area, go check it out. And that's it. Hopefully, Lord willing, he'll be at Knoxville next year. <laughs> yeah, fishing. Fishing. Yeah, because we're, right. we're fishing the Opens this year, so hopefully we can. That's what I was going to ask you. I forgot to ask you. So you All are nine? fishing the Opens. Yeah, we're, we're fishing. The men Lawson are fishing the Opens and, and going to fish some of the Toyotas. Peyton, I think, is going to fish all the Toyotas. Uh you know, he's going to try to get back into it a little bit, but men Lawson are going to try to get in the opens and go towards the elites, you know, all nine. Uh, no, not all nine. Hell no. I'm too old for that crap. Uh, 
I'm I'm gonna fish. I'm gonna fish enough to try to get qualified. <laughs> there you <laughs> go, man. You know, so so we're gonna we're gonna start in the Central's first of April down at Ross Barnett and and uh, and go from there. See what happens. Well, we'll be pulling for you. Yeah, you got 220 people on here that would be pulling <laughs> for you too. So, well, we appreciate it. That's for sure. Good luck. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks for staying on with us this long. It's it's been great, been fun, and we'll do it again here shortly. So. Everybody have a really good evening. See you.